Good evening, everyone. Today is Wednesday, March 8th, 2023. This is a meeting of the Gloucester School Committee. We are meeting at Leslie O. Johnson Road um, at the Gloucester High School Library in Gloucester, Massachusetts. With Chapter 107 of the Act 2022, this meeting will be conducted by remote participants. Public may not physically attend this meeting, but every effort will be made to allow the public to view and listen to this meeting in real time and participate when necessary. Um, I will not read the next piece about public comment. I will do it when we come back to the executive session. Um, the mission of Gloucester Public Schools is for all students to be successful, engaged, lifelong learners. Uh, we, the school committee, are going into executive session to um, pursuant to Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 21A, to discuss litigation strategy and return to open session. And I so will. Second. Roll call, Ms. Wiesen. Yes. Chairperson Clancy. Yes. Mr. Melvin. Yes. Mr. Minium. Yes. Ms. Prince. Yes. And Ms. Watson. Yes. So we're going into executive session and we will come back to resume our regular meeting as soon as we are done executive session. Good evening again. This is the Gloucester School Committee. We are resuming in open session. Um, uh, the instructions for speaking. Yeah. Okay, so I'll read the instructions for public comment for when that um, is this up. If you're calling in on a phone, you can press star nine to request to speak. If you're watching on a computer or device, there's a raise hand button that you can tap or press to request to speak. Please use either of these options during all communications to be recognized to speak. Um, I ask that you join me. Um, let's go to the right. So maybe we'll start with introductions as to who is here this evening. Start with Kate. Yes. Can you pass by one assistant superintendent? I love this superintendent. Many of the school committee. Um, Melissa Friends, school committee. Kathy Clancy, school committee. Samantha Watson, school committee. Oil Melvin, school committee. Laura Wilson, school committee. Lynn Beatty, principal at O'Malley. Kate Robertson, Curriculum and Instruction Coordinator at O'Malley. Jeff Destino, Assistant Principal at O'Malley. Maria Puglisi, Recording Secretary. Um, okay. Um, welcome, everyone. The next order of business is oral communications. If there is anyone in attendance that would like to address the committee, now is your opportunity. And we have Amy Orlando, who would like to speak. You could make, state your name and address, please. Um, hello? Hi, my name is Amy Orlando and I live at 22 Acacia Street. Um, my street is part of the new rezoning plan and I'm still having many concerns along with other parents about the uncertainty behind this plan. We have requested time and time again that families that are currently in the school with a younger sibling that will be starting school in the next couple of years be surveyed to see how many are actually affected. I've done some research on my own and came up with about 17 families. I'm sure there might be a few more, but will there actually be that many more? We've been surveyed about where we want to send our current children, and the only answer for their siblings is that we have to hope that there's space for their older siblings at their older sibling's school when they're ready to attend kindergarten. As working parents, we need more certainty. Having two children in different schools that begin at the same time pose a huge challenge for drop-off and for pickup. The schools host many special events, such as holiday concerts, PTO events, backyard growers programs, et cetera, that could potentially fall on the same day. It's too much to force parents to juggle two different schools and be fully involved in each. After attending the meeting in January for affected families, it was nice to hear that the schools are similar academically. However, there are still some big differences within the schools, as there should be. I love that the schools are all unique in their own ways. However, my children are excited to be in a school together, experiencing milestones, assemblies, and celebrations that they can both come home and talk about together. Overall, my ask is that the discussion of this can be put back on the agenda to have a discussion with families affected by the rezoning that already have children established in their own neighborhood school. 
if anything, survey and see how many families will have children entering within the next couple of years. Perhaps that will give us some more of a guarantee. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Anybody else um, in attendance that wants to speak? Seeing none, um, we will go on to or uh, go on to um, recognitions. There's a lot of things, I'm sure. Busy time. Go ahead, Laura. Well, I just wanted to start with um, Beauty and the Beast Junior at O'Malley. Um, Congratulations to everyone involved in that program. It's amazing. I know many, many fellow community members may want to say something about it. Um, just really fantastic. Uh, and so great to see so many kids involved, students involved and in participating in so many different ways. So it's really great. I wanted to commend all of them. Two things. One, I uh, wanted to uh, shout out to the West Parish. Uh, School for the presentation of Annie that uh, went on recently. They continue to roll out great plays over there. There's a tremendous amount of kids involved in, in theater over there. It's really great to see. So, uh, wonderful thing. And I also wanted to note, especially for my colleagues today, we just got up to International Women's Day, but my colleagues here uh, on the school for the educators. So, thank you for all that you do. Um, I just wanted to say, yeah, I really enjoyed uh, the plays, both, both at O'Malley and West Irish. My, my daughter in particular is quite inspired, and there's some really stellar stand-up performances uh, for, for the play at O'Malley, and uh, especially uh, memorable, I think it was Ruth B uh, that I saw with uh, the Kendall, whoever played the Candelabra character, um, was, I think she stole the show uh, in particular. I think everyone was buzzing about her. Like the accent alone, the French accent, she just just really, really nailed it. Okay. Um, we'll let the student council speak and then there's things that we want to add after that. Uh, Hi, Carvalis, thank you for joining us. Hi, can you hear us? Hey, she's muted. Just have, to, just have to unmute if you can find it. Uh, oh, okay. Maria, Mar can you unmute her? No. Okay, Lena's. It's like you're muted, Kaya. No. No, probably way more familiar with the accent. No, I Are you having trouble on finding it, finding it on mute button? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, if you can try and join on your phone. Yeah, you get, click the link on your phone. All right, one's muted. That I can't unmute. Okay, can you do you have a phone that you want to call in on? Mixed it. Maria, yeah. there's a phone number in panelists. Is that her? Oh, she's, she's dialed the number. Oh, yes, yeah, oh, yeah. she just showed us. Good, good. Kylie, try talking now. Can you guys hear me? Yes. 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 
<laughs> okay, sorry. Thank you. I apologize. Don't worry, you're doing great. No worries. Thank you. Um, so we have the blood drive coming up on March 17th. Um, so that's like fun. We got a lot of kids to donate, which is great. Um, NHS applications are due tomorrow and the induction will be on March 23rd. The power of play will be held at GHS from 11 to 2 on March 26th. A number of our NHS students will be volunteering. The hockey team and basketball team both made it into playoffs, but sadly lost in very close games. As of tomorrow, the senior countdown begins. We will have 57 school days left and 78 days total. The seal of biliteracy exam will be held in April. Last weekend, the GHS Drama Club performed a production of A Midsummer Night's Dream at Algonquin Regional High School in the METG Theater Celebration. Students at GHS were recognized for their work. Freely Dowd, lighting design, Malia Andrews, costume design, Elijah Saroof for the role of Bottom, and Willow Berry for the role of Pup. And DECA States is Friday, March 10th, and three students from GHS will be presenting. Isla Black for financial consulting, Jessica Harvey for principles of business management and administration, and Brady Patton for quick service restaurant management. And if they make it to states, or if they make it past states, they get to go to nationals, which is held in Orlando, Florida this year. So that's all I have tonight. Thank you. Uh, anybody have any questions for Kai? Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night. Thank you. So I'm going to add to the recognitions for one sport. <laughs> we have a summary here of all of our um, of all the sports this winter. The winter teams certainly had. Quite, a, quite an eventful season, um, season for each of them. Um, the girls ice hockey um, just finished its third fall season, which is quite exciting. Um, apparently years ago, there used to be varsity girls hockey, went away for quite a while. And they really, um, I remember being on the committee when they came to us to say, please, please put hockey back. And, um, and it's nice to see that it's back and really strong. Um, really, really good results from the team. Um, so I have a write-up from uh, Rob Parsons, who took over towards the end of the season and stepped in and um, really inspired girls, did a great job. Um, so he says, the GHS girls hockey team has consistently improved year over year since they returned to varsity play. And we're on the cusp of making the MIAA tournament with an eight to 12 record this season. This talented group of girls will not graduate any seniors and everyone is expected back next season for a run at becoming a tournament team. The fishermen were captained by juniors Ella Costa, Abby Lothers, Brooke Mc and Brooke Mc McNeff. Keegan Jewell was an absolute standout in her freshman year, leading the team in scoring. Caden Cusimano was amazing in net all season. I expect big things to come from this fantastic group of young women next year and the years beyond. So, great job for our girls' hockey. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, if, um, whoops, if I could share a few more just updates you know, with the public, the committee has a as a write-up, as, as um, Kathy said. Um, uh, so wrestling um, had a historic team for the program, um, produced five NEC champions, so that's our, our uh, wow. conference champions. Uh, JJ Figaro and Mercado, Aiden DeCoste, Joe Allen, Michael Toppin, and Jaden Toppin. In the States, uh, state chance state championships for the top and for both top brothers, Jaden and Michael. And the girls' tournament, a second place finish for Morgan Penamid and a top six finish for Bailey Militello. So congratulations to them at, for great performance at states. Um, uh, then, then there's then there's all states, which is a bigger tournament. Jaden Toppin was crowned all state champion. That's uh, Gloucester's first all state champion in wrestling. And then uh, Michael came in second place. And then both Michael and Jaden proceeded to the Newman Regionals. Last weekend, where Michael came in fifth and Jaden came in eighth, that qualified them to proceed to nationals next week. So it's a really uh, successful year for individuals and the team and the wrestling team. Uh, the cheer squad, the cheer squad, had a busy uh, few successful weeks. Um, they've been performing at invitationals. They won the NEC championship, qualified regionals, and now are competing this Sunday in state championships. So they're the 
They're the last uh, surviving team in terms of state championships. Uh, lots of teams that got there. Uh, girls basketball finished the uh, seven and thirteen, um, with you know more wins the past few years combined with a larger percentage of players returning for 23-24. So they're on the upswing as well. And then the boys basketball uh, qualified for the state tournament uh, and won their first two games and then fell just yesterday, I think it was, uh, to the number four seed. Um, so they reached, um, I think they probably reached the quarterfinals. And then indoor track and field also, boys and girls had very high quality performances all season. Uh, the boys were highlighted by Colton Rochford, making second in states, sixth in all states, and 12th in New England's. Max Littman in the, one mile, in, the, in, the, in the mile race, eighth in states, and our four by four hundred team uh, finished fourth. That's Colby uh, and Max, plus Justin Carlos and Bryce Rochford. And the girls were highlighted by Sky Shialino, six in the 600 meter. She came in eighth place. They're four by four in relay, finished in fifth place at states. That's Sky, also Ali Spencer, Virginia Callers, and Hope Castellucci. Um, and then this week, uh, the following student athletes are competing at nationals. So they're continuing on as well. Colby Bryce Rodeford, same seems like a fast family. Dylan Smith, Hanky Barbosa, Sky Shilino, Hope Castellucci, and Madison Goody were all continuing on to nationals. And then our swim and dive team uh, was highlighted uh, um, uh, by Willow Berry and Sarah Fernandez highlighted in the state, right? They qualified for states. So it's a really successful winter season. And uh, athletic director Brian Lafada said uh, that um, they were now gearing up for spring sports and they officially begin on March. A lot to, to talk about in terms of um, uh, <laughs> good stuff. I think it was strictly for two years. <laughs> now they're letting us lay it out. Great, do a great job. Great, great job. Okay. Uh, next item of business is the consent agenda. Does anyone have any items they would like to remove from the consent agenda? And I, I would like to remove the um, executive session minutes that will we can talk about next time we have an executive session. A minor change. Which ones? Um, I want to email you about <laughs> which one is that? FBA. Um, I think it was eight. Eight. Okay. I move that we approve the consent agenda. Second. Maria, roll call vote, please. Ms. Wiesen? Yes. Mr. Jackson? Yes. Mr. Melvin? Yes. Mr. Minio? Yes. Mr. Francis? Yes. Mr. Swanson? Yes. And just add that we want to thank Lynn Beatty for our general solution. Just to clarify that those that those are rewards for being the trip. And so I that money needs to go. Thank you. So I, I was concerned that it would uh, was be his personal uh, <laughs> bank account. It is not to clarify that. Um uh the travel companies uh, you know sort of bestow upon schools rewards for having for traveling with them. Those rewards went into uh, to, to it's obedient her name. She's put, putting it back into reinvesting them, essentially back into the trip. So, um, so my concerns were allayed. <laughs> and it's very good use of the funds, obviously. Not that I would really want to generate. No, you're a very generous person. <laughs> you know, it's really, they're being used for the purpose, basically. Okay. Uh, next time I've been, uh, um, business is deliberation on education issues and the superintendent's report. Great. Um, so, um, Full agenda tonight. Um, let me just bring up my presentation. Um, I'll start, but we got other more qualified folks to do uh, most of presenting tonight for our topics. But let me just give a few quick um, just uh, updates. So, as we know, every day matters here in our in the Glasgow Home Schools, and everybody belongs in the schools. Um, as we say every time, we really try to strive to and uh, drive to support. So our updates. So uh, just a couple things uh, about O'Malley Science Labs. Uh, I'm taking a star turn on TV. Uh, we already gave you some updates about um, the mass, uh, the, the theater, our, our drama performing arts, uh, athletics. We already gave, but and also some more pictures of, of the East Bets tour for staff. Then uh, Katie Provo is here to give us our special education update, um, and then a great great team from O'Malley. To give us an update on the learning bank parks and some of the work they're doing. So, first and foremost, um, just to start things off, 
Uh, Cape Anthony 1623 Studios re recorded live at uh, the science, uh, at, sorry, Amelia Science Lab uh, on, on Friday and interviewed sixth graders and seventh graders and eighth graders and science teachers um, and principal as well. I was a little nervous about it, but did very well. Um, <laughs> And Amy Donnelly, Dave Brand, also um, Dave Brown, sorry, also Maggie Roser from the Golf Education Foundation represented uh, GEF because GEF is such a you know, uh, you know, leader for us and really instigator um, for the innovation and the, the support from them. It's been great. And that's so they're now editing that and they're going to show it across all their platforms. So uh, can we ask, can we access cable, but also the internet and their YouTube channels? Um, and they'll be longer, longer whole show, but then also shorter clips, but it's really, I think they did a great job. They were very excited to be there. Corey Cooker opened it up, um, regaling folks with his experiences at O'Malley, which was very positive, but he was there as, as a student. Um, and that was, was amazed to hear about some of the stories, but um, anyway, just really, um, really positive um, uh, press and coverage for uh, MNA Science Labs, which is one of the strongest points of, of, of our middle school. So. On the phone, which is a crew, it's it's it's, it's they, they they it takes a lot of people to put on a TV show. But they had like four or five crew members plus the other two hosts um, helping out. There's eight creators: there's James Tejeda, Tejeda, Sean Castro. There's Crystal Beatty being interviewed. And then I'll mention, um, Kayla mentioned the Even Summer Night's Dream. Uh, and there's some photos of it. Got some uh, Malia and Aiden and Elijah Scroop, Will Berry, all uh, recognized for either their technical powers, costume design, or uh, lighting, or their performances. So, really nice job. And, and this, you know, our performing arts, you know, um, actually, it begins at the elementary schools, obviously, that it builds the high school and just really growing stronger and stronger, and more and more kids are getting involved. So, it's great. Community Beast uh, continues to this weekend. Uh, then all we all three Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Yeah, Friday night, and yeah. then matinees on Saturday and Sunday. That's, that's great. Go early, folks. There's a there's a big hockey tournament, so parking could be challenging. Mm -hmm. So go early, go often. Um, make sure you get a parking space. Right. Don't park in the grass, please. <laughs> um, but they've been doing a great job, and they're they're fantastic in getting you know, uh, our, our folks over there to make sure folks know about it. There's the athletics updates, the school zone update. So. Um, I want to update, update the committee on how the school zone, school zone update is, is, is we're carrying it out um, after uh, we came with some changes uh, in the fall. So um, uh, principals were, were you know, really clear and I supported in terms of getting this, these decisions made early on. So we did a lot of outreach with families. The families were affected um, you know, in the, in the, in the two, two zones that have been changed, really Beam and Plum Cove. We sent emails, we had a family forum for both Plum Cove and Beeman parents um, at Beeman School. We followed up directly with um, emails, phone calls, and text messages to families, those who hadn't, we hadn't heard from yet, um, to help them make a decision to answer questions, uh, conducted school tours at both O'Malley, sorry, both Beeman and Plum Cove. Um, uh, and that was by the principals and also our EL, obviously the Parsons helped out with those as well for families. Um, so, um, English is not the first language, who speak Spanish and Portuguese. Um, and then also, uh, principal called the email the families um, that are moving to the school as well. So they, and then we also we communicated and confirmed with those folks who are staying at their schools, um, we confirmed with them by, by, um, by letter as well. So was the, where we are, um, so that, so folks had the, op the option to um, notify us they would change schools. Um, of all the families, about 140 students total, um, you know, um, impact across the two the two schools. Um, seven students chose to move from Beeman to East Veterans, um, so they're they're now zoned for East Veterans, and they're going to go to East Veterans. One student chose to move from Plum to Beeman, and six students chose to move from Beeman to Plum. So only 14 students out of all those um, are moving, which is which is great. So we, we thought people would want to stay where they are, um, and the other piece is that. Um, all the families requested moves can make them. Uh, you may remember that the first and second grades at both schools from the beginning are pretty full. So we weren't sure how it would sort out. There, it was possible for a lottery where if there are a bunch of folks who want to move from one school to another, there wouldn't be room for them. But it sorted out just fine. All the folks who um, requested a move granted that move, which is great. Um, the next step is that, that school choice 
uh, for kindergartners, um, and we um, I decided and let families know in um, in January those families who have, who have whose school zone has changed and they have older siblings in the school already will be the top priority for school choice. Okay, as we've explained and worked through, can't guarantee those because we don't know which folks from the zone are going to show up and how many will will be there. But um, it really makes sense to give the folks um, who have siblings there whose, whose zone was changed to have, to have a top priority of, of all the siblings. They get top priority already because they have siblings in the school, but they sort of be bumped even higher because the school zone school zone was changed for them. Okay, so just want to update you on that. And that that happens in in, um, in um, August every year by your policy um, because that's when kindergarten registration is happening. You know, a lot happens now. And there's a lull and it happens again in the summertime. So um, it's just a bad policy. I just have a quick question on that because I forget the date that we I mean I know in enrollment continues even after the enrollment date because families enroll. Wait, where, where we going? Yeah, right. Yeah. But um if enrollment ends in August, when are you making the, the decision of the priority kids, the top yeah, priority. Yeah, so, so the, the, we have to, we make that decision first week of August. First week of August? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Then that's by the policy, it's very clear. Yeah, that. I couldn't remember what time. Yeah, first week of August. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Can I question? Sure. Um, so let's just imagine a scenario where um, a family decides not to move to their new zone to school, but then one of their siblings upcoming siblings can't yeah. move. Do you anticipate any problems or there not being space for the older kid to move to the new school district or will, or is that just a fluid transition? It really it really depends on the on the numbers, obviously, you know. And so it would, that means it depends on the grade in the classroom. It also gets moved out from existing school. So just it's just hard to break that in school. But, but we're aware that might happen and we talked that through it at the, at the, at the community at the public forum there. Um, yeah, so it's something we're, we'll, we'll pay attention, close attention to and, and we'll know ahead of time on school choice, you know, which families have the zone change. And we, we'll have that as a, as a, as a you know, um, they could, we'll be looking out for them right. and, and, and they also can deal with it. But yeah, that, that's, that's a possible scenario. And so there is the, the possible scenario that where the family would have to do split because there wouldn't be room for yeah. one at one school and one at the other. That's right. Yeah. And, and, and no one, so I don't want to minimize how difficult that is. I, I'm not, right. I, I get it. Okay. And we have families for a variety of reasons who are in two primary schools or they're across multiple schools, you know, all, all three grades, grades. You know, it's, it's part of what it's not it's never easy. Okay. Right. Even if you have a, you know, you know, high school, middle school, elementary school. And that's more by design or choice, right? Um, it's complicated, right? But lots of families, you know, do do it and they make it work and, and you can help them make it work. But again, I'm not going to say it's it's easy or it's going to prefer to get that. So um, my recall is that the date that's in the policy was kind of like um, the end, the last date, meaning it's, it's do it by X. And I believe the policy, and in the past, we've you let the superintendent have the ability that if you had enough information with which to make the allocation of kids to accept them into their school choice earlier to alleviate any you know undue stress and you know uh, uncertainty that you have the ability to do that. If you have ten kids sign up for kindergarten, you know in each classroom at a certain school, and you know you've got siblings, we are we. Our wish when we made that policy change with date, so we had moved date, was that if you knew ahead of time, we would want you and the principals to to tell those families ahead of time that we could grant their request. So, so let me look at the policy again. I I, I think of it as much more specific and directed than that. Mm -hmm. But let me but but let me check it again. Yeah, was it supposed to be right? That, that's like you can't tell until August six. It was that would be the last date you would tell them. Yeah, okay. let me let me I'll look okay. at that. Okay, and certainly, I mean. I get the challenge because families are, you know, potentially facing and, and, and want to minimize the best we can and, you know, following your policy, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll definitely look at that again and, and really, you know, clarify that um, in terms of, you know, that's, that's going to become like, you know, will, shall, may. Type well, that's why I say I don't want to give any false hope that it was still, we don't yeah. know the enrollment till the enrollment date. Right? Yeah, right. And right. even so, then we don't really know because people enroll late. Yeah. So we, 
I mean, yeah. I, I I understand what Kathy's coming from. Things happen very quickly, the way I mean it is, but but I I'll, I'll yeah. look at that just to make sure I you know I'm reading it you know very you know to the letter and very accurately, and, and then we'll we'll proceed. You know, and, yeah. Um, and then uh, latest tour. So, um, uh, Principal Matt Pusco and Assistant Principal Chris, Chrissy Lambert uh, led a tour of um, of the staff over at um, East Veterans again today. So, some more updated folder uh, photos on the left. It was hard for me to make this out at first, but this is the second floor of the building. Second floor. That is the second. Second floor, and you're and you're in the entryway above the entryway. I should say. And that's the um, uh, laminate uh, beams um, in the entryway. And you see that, that uh, big clear story window out on the, uh, I believe that's looking to the front of the building. And if you're downstairs, you'd be looking up. Yeah, if you're downstairs, you're looking up, uh, which is um, all the scaffolding has been taken away now. So what I heard from a very enthusiastic Matt Busco is that it's pretty uh, spectacular. So that's great, important to see that. On the right, is a room under construction. That is an extended learning area. Um, it looks like it's on the second floor. Yellow second floor. The, the, there, there's the other themes are by floor, and we believe yellow. The oh, yellow. No, that might be first floor. First, 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 yeah, first, first floor. Um, and there you see more of the um, not only the um, tapestry that's being installed, uh, but also the flooring that's being installed as well. And um, there is a bookshelf that is on a seating area right now. It won't be there. Uh, there's, a, there's a window seat area there for kids to sit and read together and learn together sort of stuff. So just a few photos, but things are coming along um, on budget on time. I was just going to ask that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, um, budget on time. And I understand that uh, the custodians went in and toured either last week or the week before. So oh, yeah, the right. project team's been trying to get in the city side workers to get in. So next would be uh, Katie Provo giving us an update on, on special education. Do you want me to um, present? Thank you. Thank I've got the latest version. Katie Provo, okay. our director of education, is here to give us an update on special education across the district. Sorry, I can't click that. So hello, <laughs> um, an overview of today's presentation. We will review the special education department vision, our future state and our strengths and our community supports and services, and then review some district data and trends. So looking at similar data that we looked at last year and kind of seeing how is that data changing or trending in regards to percentages of students with disabilities and percentages of the disability categories. And then what's all of here? Um, and then we'll I'll connect that to special education priority updates um, and the the three special education priority updates. It's cutting off. So I know I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, get out of this and pull up another one because something happened. Stop it. Going. It may look familiar because I used the same format on the presentation as I used last year. Thought I would stay consistent. Um, there we go. Thank you, much better. So our future state. Um, this is something that we've been talking a lot about in regards to our special education department vision and then the future state of where we wanna be, lost our public schools. Um, 
suggest to synthesize. We believe the students should be educated to the maximum extent possible alongside their peers, and we want to create inclusive educational environments for students, celebrate their differences, maximize their potential. And through individualized assessment and progress monitoring, identify the appropriate supports and remove learning barriers in order to ensure that students are provided with high quality, meaningful education. And we want students to be proud of themselves and recognize their future potential and become positive and contributing members of this. So, Society. I'm going to add a couple things here. This is and this is work that this is really driving the work that which we can talk more about. But just this today, for example, uh, all the principals and um, district leaders and Gary Frisch were working at you know digging into this and understanding even more you know what it means for where we want to go and how we want to get there. Um, the things that are already in place because they you know. Um, a number of things that are already in place that are happening. Um, one of the things is, um, and, and Kate will show data on this at the moment, is just um, how much inclusion and how much uh, how how much our students with disabilities are included in general classrooms, and it's a real um, strength of ours. But then also we're identifying things with our leadership team about you know, challenges and barriers that we face on an ongoing basis. You know, and what's really important, and we're really trying to stress very. Uh, consistently now um, is just the collaboration has to happen you know, within a school, um, across schools, and you know, across the entire district uh, around moving towards this. Really, so we have things in place, but we have, have also work to do. So um, we will share more about that. So embedded within our vision are the following principles. We want all students, all students are general education students first, and we focus on their strengths. General education and special education must work together, and that will connect to a later slide. Um, and we want to ensure a continuous cycle of improvement, improvement beyond just the plans for the Department of Ed. Using data to make our decisions and making sure our students are engaged and we welcome parent community and student partnerships. Special education strengths. We, I keep saying how wonderful of a community this is. Um, their staff are caring and empathetic and really want what's best for students. The culture is collaborative and we have a very diverse student population, which anyone that works here wants to be here with that diverse student population. That's, that's very apparent. Um, we're well-staffed. We are well-staffed for special education in regards to having supports and services for a variety of different programs, different disabilities, um, and those resources in order to meet the needs of our students. And then our district-wide programs. So we have some well-established district-wide programs within the district, which really help us to be able to support students in-house versus needing to send them out of district. And this is just a review of our supports and services, which shows how much we have in place already through special education. Um, the disabilities that we work with, our team of educators and specialists, and then a list of our district wide programs. And now we get into some data, new the data and the trends and looking at what does the data tell us. Um, this is a table that shows the percentage of full inclusion, partial inclusion, substantially separate, and out of district. That last tab is out of percentage of out of district over the course of the years. So when we look back at trends for where our full inclusion rates are and where we're trending, we can see that we were trending up until 2021. And then there was a bit of a dip. We dipped a little bit back down in regards to full inclusion. But we are still, as you'll see on the next slide, above the state average. Um, some of, when we look at this data, we can see that our partial and a substantially separate have stayed pretty consistent over time. Um, our out of district placements, you can see they have gone up um, over the course of the last of the, the last year into this year. Um, and that really is a result of we've had a number of move-ins that were already placed in out of district placements. Um, I think we've had about five this year that were already out of district when we moved into us. And we've also had some students with more significant needs that we haven't been able to meet through our district-wide programs. And we've had to look at something more restrictive. 
you have a question? I do. Okay. Two, two questions. One, uh, is, is there any point here full inclusion, partial inclusion? The word inclusion sounds great, but is there any, is there ever an, is there ever a, a scenario where over inclusion or, or could, could over inclusion not be a good thing? Does that make any sense? Where it does. Why don't we go? If, if it's okay, we'll go to the next slide and I'll kind of talk a little bit, a bit more about what each one of those mean. Oh, okay. that you led right into my slide. It's a good thing <laughs> to talk before the meeting. Um, so this breaks it down into what percentage. I'll I'll get to your question as well, but this breaks it down into the percentage of what does the placement mean. So when we go through the IEP and we write the services, those services add up to a certain number of minutes. So you're first looking at what's the disability impact, what are the accommodations and modification, modifications and specially designed instruction the student needs, then what are the services they need, where do they take place? Do they take place in the general education classroom or outside of the general education classroom? And that's where when you add up those minutes, it results in either a full inclusion placement, partial or sub-separate. So full inclusion you'll see is 80% or more, they're in the general education setting, but they are coming up, they may be coming out of the general education classroom to receive services up to 21% of their day. Partial inclusion, there's a range from 41 to 79%, they're in the general education setting, and then services are provided outside of the gen ed setting for 21 to 59%. So you can see that range. Um, Substantially separate students that are placed in some district-wide programs. We do have a lot of students in our just our district-wide programs that are partial inclusion as well. Um, substantially separate doesn't mean they're always all day in a small group setting, not interacting with peers. It could be zero to forty percent. Each IEP is an individualized education program. That's what it's called, and it. So the minutes for what is included, where they're included or not included, is based on the data and based on the team decision as to what does the student need in order to achieve their goals and benchmarks and where do those services need to take place in order for them to, to maximize their growth. So each of those decisions is made at the table with the team and then that's how you get your placement. So to, to say, is there too much inclusion, too little inclusion, it's student dependent. Um, upon what do they need based on their IEP. Research does show um, that students that have full inclusion placements tend to have stronger outcomes. They feel more like they belong. And, but that is authentic inclusion for a student with high needs is, is not an easy thing to do. Um, you need a lot of resources. You need um, to really be able to build that. It's not. So I don't, did that answer your question? It does, and I think the key word for me there was authentic. Like you can, you know, you can say, oh, it's all, it's, uh, you know, so many percentages of kids are, it, 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 inclusion is built into that. Well, um, I think the real key is that it be authentic mm -hmm. inclusion. And that those yep. bulk on services that go with that to support the kid or the student is really the value of it. Just including a student for the purpose of percentages and inclusion yeah. isn't necessarily meeting the needs. It's about what's the authentic inclusion. Yeah. What does that look like? And only because you spoke about it a minute ago, um, can I dovetail into a second question? You sure can. Okay. Um, you talked about kids that are coming into our district that need special services. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're kind of up against it, or the, the cost of that plus transportation is a big item for the school committee, obviously, and it's transporting kids. But in that evaluation of a new student coming into the district, I mean, is it, is it, is it just kind of assumed that if a kid received, if a kid was, was sent out of, out of district for services, is that the assumption when they come here or is there, a, is there an evaluation that says, well, maybe he doesn't need Great question. Uh, Great question. If the student's IEP says that they are in a substantially separate program placed in a either a public or private right. or a residential, it's a legal document. Yeah. So when they move to us, we follow that legal document. Okay. Um, 
we then start to get to know the student. We attend the, I, the uh, district coordinator attends the team meetings. We are part of the team writing the annual reviews and looking at data. Um, and every year a student that's out of district, every year we look at, is the student making effective progress? What do they need for supports and services? And what do they need for placement? Um, so that's a yearly decision that, that's discussed with each team. But what, if a student moved into the district and had the IEP, that's, we need to follow that. Does that? So we don't evaluate and then send them out. Right. There's if no they already there. have an IEP that says this is where they're placed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's varying needs. Various placements are for various disability profiles or various needs. Um, I looked back at last year, and we did have about five move-ins last year as well that were out of district when they moved in. They were, um, most of them were in the collaboratives, so it was a lower yeah. cost. Yeah. Thank you. And when, when we compare ourselves to, to the state, so the state average for full inclusion is 67.2% and we're at 73.6. So while we dipped a little bit this past year, um, we still are above the state average. This data is all from October 1st of each year. So the data gets uploaded and entered October 1st of each year. And then that's where I pulled it from. So it's consistent year to year. So this isn't today's data, but this is October of 2022. But you can see that that increase. But when you looked at just to go back really quickly for the out of district, just to find out our percentage of out of district for is six point seven, and the state average is six point six. So we're right alongside with the state average. We're not um, significantly above that at all. Yeah. Thanks. This is twenty one twenty two data. So. This is the percentage of students with disabilities compared to our local area districts and compared to our dark area districts, which are demographically similar districts. There's a couple of new ones on the dark that shifted. Peabody used to be, didn't used to be a dark district. I don't think that it is now. But as you can see, we are consistently falling above all other local area and similar demographic districts in regards to our percentage of students with disabilities. So the state average is about 19% and we're at 25.4, which is a slight decrease from last year, we were at 25.6, so slight decrease. Um, and this data is important for a variety of reasons. It's important because when we look at the amount of resources that we're putting into, we want to, into special education, into evaluations, we want to make sure that we are fully supporting all students. Um, and 25.4% is, is a pretty high number. So it's not that we don't wanna provide the services to students that need it. We wanna make sure we are. There's just so many supports that we have through general education that we can meet students' needs with, especially with RTI, MTSS. I think you'll talk a little bit, you know, that's a little bit of, um, educational language, but the tiered interventions that, that we have in place in our schools right now uh, um, are strong. And we're, if we're able to support and meet the students' needs through tiered interventions before they go through for an evaluation, then we are, if they're making effective progress, there's no need to move forward with an evaluation because we're meeting their needs and they're making effective progress. And that's really more of the goal is looking at what can we provide for interventions and supports for all students and not have that fear of, well, if they're not on an IEP, they're not going to get their needs met because we have so many things in place in our schools. I think that's a crucial um, or a potential misconception there is that a student can be identified with a, with a disability, but that doesn't mean they all automatically are on IEP or get services, okay? Because if they're making effective progress and they don't qualify, it's, it's that combination of a disability and not making effective progress. So I think you're just reading what Katie's saying is that with high quality tier one instruction and other supports, um, you know, you can, it's often that not often, it's often it can it happens that um, students won't be placed with additional services. But that, that's a folks often think that diagnosed disability equals special education services. That isn't um, you know, a direct correlation. Yeah. 
Or no, sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, my question is um, Do parents ever disagree with the term infective progress and really want more support than how you resolve those? those differences between what a parent's expectation for their child is um, versus some of the benchmarks that we might use. So we have the program coordinators who all run the team meetings um, and data is very important. This is why we're looking really closely at our evaluation and eligibility tools to ensure more consistency amongst when we have a referral from through for special education, what questions are we asking? What questions do we need to answer based on the referral? What is the suspected disability area? What areas are impacted? What testing do we then use to collect that data and look at where is the student? And part of that data reflecting is the curriculum-based assessments and looking at the date, the universal screenings and the progress monitoring data from the general education teacher. That's a big part of it. Um, we're looking at that whole picture when we come together at the team meeting. It's not just one little area. So with that effective progress can, we, we do, I do have some data that I've shared with the program leaders around what does effective progress mean and what does it, what does it not mean? But it really is a combination of and compared to, so their, their same age peers, are they making progress at a rate that is going to close that gap? That was sort of the question. If you could just define effective progress <laughs> and what that looks like, because my assumption is that public education doesn't mean maximum progress for right? special education, right? Um, right? And as a parent, I mean, you want your kid to make maximum progress, not just effective progress, right? And so I would mm -hmm. imagine that there's some discrepancy in there, and in, uh, in people's opinion mm -hmm. on, you know how well their kid could be doing or not. And so it would so, be helpful to know what the district defines or the state defines really as effective progress. So I don't have the definition in front of me, but I can find it and share it with you all of what we have. Um, it's really around when you're, when you're coming to the table to establish eligibility. Is there a disability? If there is, you ask, are they making effective progress? That's where the discussion will happen around the data. Um, if they are not making effective progress, then you go to the next question, question, which is, do they need specially designed instruction? So then you're asking, what is the specially designed instruction they need? In regards to the effective progress, um, there are students that are, I can't say exactly how it's been running at the meetings, but I, I'm pretty sure that we, I know at the elementary level, we have our curriculum based data. We look at the dibbles, we look at the star. Um, it's looking at in relation to the cognitive ability. So if their overall cognitive ability is lower, are they working up to their potential for their cognitive ability? If their cognitive ability is high and their achievement is lower, then they're not making progress according to what they could in, in regards to their cognitive ability. But you have to, there's so many different pieces of the puzzle that there is no one simple answer. You really have to look at multiple points of data to determine are they closing the gap. I like to look at visual data, so seeing um, more of a trend line on from the curriculum based data as to are they on target for meeting the benchmark and what does that that trend line show? Does it show that they're on target for meeting that benchmark by the end of the year or are they below and if, or are they above? Um, yes. Yes, you just I just defined it. Okay. <laughs> so if they're on target from meeting the benchmark by the end of the year or exceeding, that's effective progress. Does that help? Yeah, the parents are involved. Oh, thanks. Um the, the and it's part of the team decision. So the parents are part of the team. And so in that that sort of line, right, that trend is based on their cognitive So it's sort of it's varies kid to kid. Um, or is that very prescriptive? Want, regardless of the cognitive ability, we always want to be seeing that progress and seeing that trend line closing gaps. And Kathy, you asked about what, what happened to the disagreement. Okay, so let's get to, get to that because there's processes. And so if, um, 
if the team disagrees, if the parent disagrees with the results or anyone on the team, if, if the parent disagrees with the results, they have the right to an independent evaluation. Um, with our percentages, I don't know that there are, I have not heard of a lot of disagreements in regard to whether or not they were eligible for special education. Um, more of the conversations that occur are students that are already on IEPs and looking at are they making effective progress once they're on an IEP. So it's two, it's effective progress for disability and do they need special education services, but there's also effective progress within the annual IEP and are they making effective progress towards their goals. Go ahead, Brian. Um, so I have a sort of a, I want to sort of back up a little bit and um, understand the range of things that will be included in the disability. Um, understand the what? The range of, of um, conditions, the range of things that will be identified as a disability. So we're going to show you actually the, uh, uh, the, 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 the different categories. The categories oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I think that'll be helpful. So I'll wait for that. Yep. <laughs> is, this, is this standardized across the state? These uh, you know, categories. Disability, ca yes, there is. Yeah. So, so there so is. Looking at this data with the percentages, obviously we have the highest on that graph. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I just want to make sure we're using the same same metrics. <laughs> yes, this is all data that's from the it's put out by the department. Yeah. I mean, I mean we're just using the same same like you know uh, litmus, you know. So they're comparable. It, ultimately, it's a team decision. The yeah. team makes the decision. Okay. Um, all right. All right. There are the, the Department of the, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act has rules around this. These are the definitions for educational disabilities mm -hmm. and what would qualify for, under IDEA for that. Mm -hmm. yep, the, um, I mean, if, not, if, not, if we not, think food service has a lot of regulation to guide and special education is is it's much much more so it's very very um, high, highly regulated in terms of the processes the law um qualification that sort of stuff both at the federal and state levels so um and that's one of the things that, you know, we want to continue to monitor is our our, our our evaluation says uh, Processes, you know, are they both effective, but they also follow all, you know, in compliance. Um, you know, and, and then the other piece is, um, uh, yeah, um, pieces, you know, those are two pieces, you know, and then and obviously, then all our services and support have an impact, you know, but those are, you know, it's the qualification, there's the, there's the progress, which do you so. Okay. So you mentioned the second opinion piece, so like they have the right to get a second mm -hmm. opinion. I have some questions about that, but I don't know if you want to wait until after your presentation. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, it so makes sense until after closed out the presentation. No, I know. I know. Yeah. Cause, cause... Okay. I'm happy to wait. I just, you know, you had mentioned it, so I just I wanted to jump like on that. Yeah. yeah, I can. I mean, we can. Okay. Yeah, Perfect. I don't want to. Really slow. <laughs> You're getting some questions tonight. Jim. I am. It's all right. I'm ready. Um, this is a snapshot of special education enrollment by age. So this was again October 1st, 2022, a snapshot of um, the number of students that had disabilities by age. So you can see, it's kind of interesting. There aren't there weren't any identified that were five at that time, but um, you can see that that trend where age ten, which is around fourth grade, there is a spike, um, and another spike is age sixteen, which this is an unusual spike for being sixteen and and for this many students. So. If this data would warrant kind of digging them a little further and looking at what a lot, why, why is it flowing like this, or looking at trends over time as to do we see patterns um, in grade levels? Do we see that there's more students that um, begin to get identified in third or fourth grade where reading for meaning becomes so much more important than learning to read? And if they haven't learned how to read yet, then they're going to struggle even more, and that may be when they're getting identified. So it just shows, it, I thought it was a good snapshot visual. 
Um, this is the most common disability category. So this is the trends um, for our local area districts and the DART districts as to most common, second most common, third most common. For 21-22, we, we had learning disabilities, LD stands for learning disabilities, um, was our most common, health was the second, and communication was right behind it as the third. So you can see kind of how we compare and how other, dis other districts are falling in regards to their percentages and their most common disability trends. I did hide, I bolded ASD on here because I think it's important to see that while it's not our top three right now, it is a disability that is trend that is really becoming more predominant. Um, it's becoming more of one of the top three disabilities, autism, in many districts. Um, it goes along with the communication too, the communication disability and the autism. So we have to, we are working on programming with our students and you'll see a little later on, but. Can you explain this, uh, a couple of examples of health? Health, health is most of the students that qualify under health, it's often ADHD. It qualifies under health, but it could be a medical reason, um, could be any type of health. But often, students with ADHD and the attention and executive functioning that's categorized under health. Right. I was concerned last time, I think, when you pre presented this information about the communication, it seemed like it was training up. Yes. Uh, is there, has there been like a plateau? So, this is 22 23 oh. data. So this, this, is this, what, this was 21, 22, and now when we look at 22, 23, we can see that our most predominant disability category is communication. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, when you look back at the previous slide as to most common, it's not the most common in other districts. It's yeah. top three, but not the most common. So there, you can see that it's it's, We've ours has shifted. We still have the same top three: learning disabilities, health, and communication. But they flipped order with communication being the highest. Autism's at eleven percent. There are so, a number of students with autism that also have communication disabilities. And if we were to look at what's the primary and what's the secondary, um. I, some of our students that are, have autism do have that disability category. Communication is their primary. So I think that is capturing some of them in this category as well. Um, but yeah, it is it is trending up. The speech and language pathologists are, are seeing that trend at the early childhood level, with, uh, yeah. especially at the early childhood level right now. Um, yeah, good for, um, for, for your question. This is sort of speaks to right. No, this is very helpful. Um, and, and you know, I'm I don't know very much about sort of the um, psychology and the sort of diagnoses, but um, my question has to do with um, how these um, disabilities can um, be pre present in behavioral issues in a classroom. Um, and how that impacts the entire classroom. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, so again, I don't know enough about what it means to have a communication disability and how that impacts behavior. Mm -hmm. um, my sense is that some of these are quite have quite a big impact on behavior in a in a group setting. So I'm just wondering if you would speak a little bit to, um, as we integrate, you know, as we work to have everyone together as much as possible, if there's also monitoring of how behavioral issues are impacting other students, um, the school, and how that, you know, how, what the interplay is there. Because as these issues grow, my assumption would be it's having a bigger and bigger impact on all students. So, Behavior in and of itself is not a disability category. But like you said, many disabilities have the impact of behavior coming out because of the disability. So the behavior is all about communication. It's all about um, when behaviors occur, they occur because a student either doesn't isn't able to access or they don't feel like they can access or they're frustrated. 
Um, so we are always looking at what behaviors are occurring and how we best supporting students and best meeting their needs in order to decrease those behaviors. The, the state of Massachusetts, and I believe across the country, um, is seeing a big, significant increase in behavioral and social emotional needs. When we look at what is our fourth most common disability category is emotional impairment. Um, emotional impairment may have externalizing behaviors, it may be internalizing behaviors, but we are having more and more students identified with anxiety, depression, um, various emotional disabilities. And meeting their needs can be challenging if we can't figure out the underlying reason why those behaviors are occurring. Typically, there's a lagging skill that is causing a behavior to occur. If we can identify what that lagging skill is and put supports and tools in place and do some explicit teaching, then we can see the behaviors go down. That's the whole. So I don't know if that answered your question. Well, I guess I'm thinking about the school as a community, right? And um, and about um, how how we're communicating to the entire community about behaviors that may impact other children, other students as well. Um, obviously, given that the school is doing everything in its power to, you know, to meet every student's need. Mm -hmm. um, but none of this is happening in a vacuum. Um, is so is so it's it's sort of a tricky question. Like how um, you know, I know that you and the team are doing such a good job to, you know, to try to find the underlying frustration or the underlying issue and meet that need. Um, and I'm also wondering about sort of the school community that um, is um, exposed to those needs or to those outbursts um, and how, how we work in both ways. Because I know firsthand that student needs are impacting other students um, directly. Um, and I don't know how we, I'm not sure how we, how you or how we as a community um, can work, you know, with that understanding while we're meeting, sort of to meet all students. I think, I mean, like this is, um, this is one of the most difficult things probably in, in part of school, is it? and especially right now, mm -hmm. you know, so I'll, I'll just be clear, you know, that it's be you know, direct about it is, you know, post pandemic, we and every other school system I'm, I'm aware of um, is is experiencing a higher range of. Um, uh, I'm not sure what the right, right words are, but you know everything from you know dysregulated behavior, explosive behavior, you know, um, and then also a, a, a real shift in what the sort of the baseline of what's what's normal, okay, what's what sort of regular interaction communication. Okay. We see that across all grades, um, so that's that's happening. It's happening in our schools, you know. Um, and at the same time, and and, and that you're, you're you know absolutely um, when uh, a child has a you know significant you know incident, event, disruption, um, outburst, um, that can affect a small number of kids or a large, large number of kids. Um, and you know, and that's something that's, that's you know really difficult at that moment for lots of reasons. You know, one is you know we can't. It's not. Um, we're not able to explain to everybody what's happening and why it's happening, and or would we? You know, um, and yet, um, people, you know, kids are affected and learning's affected. That sort of stuff. Um, you know, and and, and uh, but when that's escalated in the way it has right now, and, and our schools are really doing the best they can to sort things through. And that's like, well, that's the folks at this table, it's the folks at that table, it's the teachers, obviously, it's our paraprofessionals, you know, it's our bus drivers. Um, it's it's not something that we can easily just you know, flip a switch on. Um, you know, and I think I think it's a it's a good question of how do we communicate that um, challenge to families, you know, and, and I don't think we have any, you know, I don't I'm not gonna stand here and say I've got like the answer on that one, but um because it's a tricky business, obviously. You know, we want to, um, you know, um, respect the privacy of that individual and that family. Um, and at the same time, like, you know, very clear to that. Just, it's just, it's not, um, 
it's more challenging now than it has been. Um, and, and different territory. It really is. No, I appreciate that there. I, I clearly know there's no way to flip the switch. I mean, yeah, no, right, right, right. Yeah, no, no, but I, I hear what you're saying. I just, I feel like, um, I feel like it's a part of this conversation. That's all. Like, that's, that's what I'm feeling. Like, dysregulated behavior, whatever the reason, impacts more than that's. And another piece of it, which most folks don't understand, and no, no, or should they, is but all we should, okay, is that going back to the laws, you know, students with IEPs, they're, they're, they're very specific laws, and they're, they're different rules, you know, laws, for them in terms of how, how you know, what the, how we approach them in terms of discipline when it's related to their, their, their disability. And there, 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 there are different restrictions and different um, processes because of that. You know, not I, I will never ever say that discipline, you know, kids out of out of things actually is that effective. Okay, but there are some tools we have with that we, that we don't really have at our disposal with the kids when it's a um, behavior is related to disability, you know, the manifestation of their disability, um, and then folks don't know that. You know? Um, and what can we explain that that well other than what I'm saying right now? Mm -hmm. But that does that change the equation a little bit. Um, you know, in terms of in terms of what uh, our schools are. When, sure. you, when you look at the kind of pieces of the pie with emotional and health in, in regards to our Gloucester district, it's more than a quarter of the pie. And, and that's often where you see the dysregulated behaviors with the emotional impairments and HD where it's hard to, to regulate um, compared to the state. It's similar. They're, they're a little bit less of the pie, but it's still about a quarter of it. So in, and it's when you look back to the slide previously, you see most common disabilities, how emotional health, autism, those are all becoming more of our common disabilities in the schools. And they weren't years ago. They were the disability categories that were the much smaller pieces of the pie. We have some really strong interventions for students with learning disabilities. We've learned a lot about what a, what, about learning disabilities and what research shows that's effective for instruction. Um, so while we still have students, we still have a significant piece of the pie for learning disabilities, I think we we have a really strong handle on how are we supporting them meeting their needs and how are they making progress. Whereas students with emotional or behavioral difficulties, especially post pandemic, um, it's it's really, it's a struggle for our schools right now for, for all of them. Sam has a question. Can you go back to that? Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. So in relation to all of these different, um, disability categories. What, what if any, are the limitations in our testing and actually diagnosing all of these? Oh, you're getting really big questions at me, Samantha. <laughs> um, so we should have the capacity to be able to conduct testing mm -hmm. and come up with any of the educational disability categories autism, neurological development, any of these, we can give an educational diagnosis. Yeah. It's not a medical diagnosis. Oftentimes with autism or neurological, um, we can say it's the suspected area and it's, it's, it meets the educational criteria. That's what we're looking at in our, when we're doing our testing and looking at what disability category does most fits the profile of the student. It's an educational disability category that then meets the needs for services through the school. It's not medical. So um, we are looking at what do we have for tools? What do we have for assessments? And how do we make sure we're maximizing and training our staff who do the testing to be able to have a repertoire of tests? We're looking at when we get a referral, we know, okay, if the suspected area of disability is autism, do we have the right tools to really be looking at that and then drive how we're developing the IEP in order to only focus mm -hmm. on their needs. Um, specific learning disabilities, we've done training this year, which you'll see at a later slide, but 
we've done a lot of training this year with the special education teachers across the district on really understanding and learning how to score, how to how to school, how to administer score and start to in, and interpret diagnostic reading assessments. So the CTOP, the Tower, the GORE, those all really give you the information you need in order to know is there an underlying reading disability. Yeah, I guess like for things like health and social emotional stuff, right? Those are growing categories. And I could be completely wrong, but my assumption is that as a school district, we're not diagnosing depression or anxiety in kids. If he has to meet the educational criteria. So we're saying this meets the educational criteria, most of, of emotional impairment. We do have medical diagnoses that come in, depends on what evaluations have been done privately brought to the table versus what are we doing? So we are always looking from an educational standpoint, does it meet the educational criteria? So emotional disability, there is, um, for educational purposes, there is a flow chart of questions that we need to ask. Oh, okay. um, so it's not if it depression is is it's more around are there emotional challenges that yeah, are that are over an extended period of time and impacting all areas. So that's really really more, that's really more where as they may, to the medical diagnosis. Right. In the report they they'll do rating scales and they'll say that this is what the rating scales showed for where they're elevated, they may be elevated in depression, elevated in anxiety. Those are areas that we want to look into. And then um, do they fit the eligibility, eligibility criteria and develop the money? So then if so, if like somebody has a therapist at the table and they say this child has been actually diagnosed with mm -hmm. you know X, Y, and Z, you take that into consideration. Yes. Take consideration. yes. I just, I just want to push on that a little bit further because we are a school and not a hospital. So, um, and I know the work that comes out of your department is top notch because I talk to a lot of families that are involved. And I have never heard a complaint about our special ed department. That's one thing I can say in all the years being here. The families are walking away here mm -hmm. happy and feeling heard and appreciate the services that go on in this district. If there's anything to praise Gloucester District and Gloucester Public Schools for, it's it's the love and care that we give our kids, especially from this department. But I just want to make sure um, if we're going to start bringing up depression and anxiety and things like that, and I think you you touched on it a little bit, um, is that we're not making those diagnoses. We're not. We're making, not trained to make those diagnoses. We're not, and we don't want to. And we don't need to. And we don't need to. And that's when we would refer them to go to their doctor and get that independent. But we, they, I just want to be clear that so I'm we're not diagnosing depression, yeah. anxiety. Right. Um, we are saying when we do our psychological evaluations, there's yeah. rating scales that endorse certain yeah. elements, and anxiety might be like if you answer a majority of these questions a certain way, anxiety will be <laughs> elevated. So that's yeah. part of the student right. profile that they're exhibiting that anxiety. Yeah. That doesn't mean we're saying they have. We're not saying they they have depression or anxiety or a mood disorder, we're saying these are symptoms that came up and they came up across parents, um, parent rating scales, teacher rating scales, they're showing up across all areas. But then we look at what is the, under the disability categories, do they meet the criteria, the educational criteria for emotional impairment? It's an umbrella term. Similar to, you may get a medical diagnosis of dyslexia, which is a learning disability. The educational definition of learning disability, it doesn't say dyslexia in educational. It says specific learning Im impacted, check the areas. So it, it's different than a medical diagnosis. And I think that does get confusing. I think sometimes parents feel as though they need to get that independent eval that then right. says they have a disability in order to qualify. We're, we're if, they, if, if a parent submits an independent eval, we still have the right to do our own evaluation through our school system and look at what do they look like educationally and what do we as experts see educationally that they need. I just want to make sure that our messaging is clearly defined that we're doing the educational part, you know, and mm -hmm. I don't want to give parents a false, a false hope that we're going beyond that, you know, as far as the depression and the anxiety and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I just, I see that as a, a line that, not that you can clearly draw it in the sand because a lot goes on 
for different diagnoses. But I just want to make sure that, um, not make sure, but I just want to hear that our diagnosis is based on educational and not so much a medical, unless the independent medical evaluation right. is brought into the conversation at the table. Correct. Otherwise, it's and all the, hopes and expectations that can come from that. The specific, the IEP that lists the evaluation results, if there's an independent eval that comes to the table or a medical diagnosis that's part of the eval, if we say we want a health assessment, getting input from the doctor, the doctor is saying ADHD, so we have her that yeah. information from the doctor that we're saying there's this, this is the disability category. We have documentation from the doctor, but it's all about what evaluation tools are we using to collect that data and put it in the education. And then again, it may have a medical diagnosis of disability. But then again, the other pieces of it is um, are they making effective progress back to earlier documentation? And do they need specially designed instruction? And do they need like, yes. And then, Say that again. Do they need specially? So it's the all, the flow chart of eligibility. Is there evidence of a disability? You which category? Um, if it falls into, if you say yes, then you go to the next question. Are they making effective progress? I think that's where there may be some not some clarification that needs to happen on what is effective progress. But then the next question, even if they're not making effective progress, you then ask, do they need specially designed instructional related services? And then, if yes is to all, they qualify for special education through the school system. Thank you. Does that help? Yeah, it does. Um, so I'll try and be brief. Um, I'll just try and be quick, brief on these. Sorry, just a quick question: Does this include out of state? I mean, out of district placements? Uh, this data? Yes. Okay. For disability categories, yes. Okay. And I don't know if we want to turn towards the work we're doing to continue to strengthen this work. And that's why it was the one animation I put in there for flipping. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. The work we're doing. Um, so strengthening our special education practices and processing this um, a summary statement around what we're going to get into in the details here. Um, so the three department Goals, the strengthening of special education, it's priority four. And really, the first one is around strengthening and building consistency with our evaluation and eligibility processes. Looking at what do we have for tools? What do we have for the structure? What do we have for staff resources? How much time do staff need in order to complete the evaluations? How much time does that then take away, if any, from students getting receiving their services if they're needing to? If there are too many evaluations occurring. Um, so looking at that, looking at trends for our eligibility data, and then in developing targeted professional development for that. So that really goes along with that professional development around if we're seeing that emotional impairment is high, then we need to really look, which it is, um, and the behaviors are occurring, then we need to really look at our professional development needs to target around supporting with strategies and for behavior management and how to um, ensure that, that we're meeting those needs. The, I talked a little bit about the training already. Um, goal two is IEP program development. For this year, we're really looking at special education coordinators. We're doing consults and case, including case studies, looking at specific um, team meeting protocols. What are we using to ensure parents feel as though they're involved? Um, we are working on creating a parent survey that we can provide to parents after IEP meetings to get their feedback and find out um, if, if they feel as though they understood what you know, the process and that their needs were met. Um, and then we did have our tiered focus monitoring review from DESE. They had their on-site visit this year. We did our self-assessment last year. We are still awaiting the written results, but she, we did meet and we had there's two potential findings that we're going to need to develop an action plan for. Um, one is our educational assessments, and the other is our progress report writing. So looking at, at the data over time and are they making progress. And this is really around the strengthening of our instructional practices consultation and the continuum of services. So looking at our district-wide programs and looking at our autism program specifically, and how we're building in additional consult consultation through the BCBA, through an AAC consultant, which is augmented about part of communication. So communication is becoming a higher level of need. 
and um, we are seeing more students with autism and having that AAC specialist be able to come in and coach and support our SLPs and the teachers is really been really, really helpful. Um, we did have training with Jessica Minahan, train the trainer. She's the author of the behavior code. We had some psychologists and adjustment counselors and program staff that participated in that for early releases. Are you laughing at me? No, I'm Bill Mel. We need someone to read. Okay. <laughs> um, and then the specialized reading curriculum. So the, the materials and the resources for making sure that we're able to support our students when they do have small group reading and they're pulled out of the classroom. Do we have the right materials and resources depending on their profile? So we're in Gillingham for learning disabilities. We piloted language this year in our learning center at the middle school, which is for students that are significantly below um, grade level for reading and at the 900 level in the high school. So for students that are at least two plus years behind. And then the final is, this is the kind of epitome and most important of all the work. It's connecting general education and special education. It's priority two, so it's not priority four, but Amy and I are working together with a committee of amazing, an amazing committee um, around looking at inclusive practices, looking at what do we have for resources and really making sure that we have processes in place um, to look at our tier one instruction, our intervention. So are we targeting and meeting the needs of our students? Are we providing the right professional development? Did you want to check in with that? The, the, the work we're doing um, with that uh, committee is amazing. Um, it, we have representation from all grade levels on, on the committee. Um, they put together a survey and sent a, we, the teacher sent it out, not us, to their peers. And um, we have just recently analyzed the survey. And I'm excited because they're identifying specific areas that they want professional development and where we can make some changes and support them through um, inclusive practices and those kind of things. So there's some teachers that are really stepping up and, um, you know, taking a lead role in this work. So it's nice to see and giving us direction of where they need support. And that's, I think, where the ships are, the, 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 the things to pay attention to here in terms of work we're doing, you know, all the, as, as laid out in the plan, is, is we work on curriculum instruction, um, and then the work on professional development, are related to those related to tier one instruction, so the, the, the instruction that every kid gets every day. But then these other pieces to professional development, non specialized instruction. So you see the last three bullets, as Katie talked about, um, and then the um, the resources we've we put into our BCBAs, um, board certified behavior analysts. Um, we, you know, uh, through ESSER money, doubled the number of those folks we have. Those are folks who are highly trained, you know, professionals on really. Um, understanding student behavior and then consulting with our staff and our principals on uh, strategies for um, changing student behavior um, and they're, they're a great team um, and then rbt so that's behavior training behavior technician um, folks and that's training that uh, we'll do more with our um, paraprofessionals um, the aac is um, a quick um, shout out um, that's on the, the, uh, the communication devices. And what we see, and that's training that hasn't been done before on a, on a large scale. <clears throat> We've done it with a, a lot of social education and, and Paris as well, right? Paris, yes, yeah. and I can jump in. And so, not all, like, so she's going in, we have somebody coming in and training and modeling and working with the students on the AAC devices. And we started a new tier one, um, it's called LAMP. So it is a certain program that goes on the, the iPad. Um, and we're really seeing that as the students are learning more functional communication, their behaviors are going down um, because they have language, they just don't have a voice. So we are seeing some really, I mean, I would love to get parent permission and show you some videos of um, some students. And I, I think that they would be excited to show it as well. But we have some parents that are really excited saying that their students are using the devices at home now um, spontaneously. Um, so that's a, a tool that we're providing students that's really, we're seeing a big impact. 
impact at the at a young age. So, and then one last piece, and then also the training on, on the on the evaluation the assessment. So I'm trying to verbalize a great job, which is you know there there's we're having experiencing where parents and students are having a difficult time because the student can't doesn't have the communication with the AC devices. Um, but two things happen when we help our paraprofessional or, 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 or teachers use those devices well is the kids start you know, helping the kids use them. As Kate described, the kids then commu can communicate what they want to, um, and they're having more success. And then, of course, the adults have more success as well, because that their whole, their whole purpose, right, is helping this child, and it's been difficult. You know, so that's what, whether it's a specialized reading um, instruction, whether it's the um, behavior consults, whether it's the AC consultation, learning that, that whether it's the you know, training on curriculum, you know, on, on tier one curriculum around wit and wisdom or at O'Malley with their, with their, you know, uh, the new uh, BLA curriculum. Is that? Don't give it away. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, those mm -hmm. are pieces that are, that are, you know, <laughs> underway. I'm not going to say it's a done deal, you know, but they're right. underway and they already are making an impact and it's making more success for students and therefore more success for our staff. So those are the things that are really starting to shift. And I think, I feel like we're paying close attention to the needs of our, our students therefore so that uh, you we we'll talking about students that can't actually vocally communicate yeah. and they my son mentioned something he was amazed he, like he said there was a student that that had a device he could communicate west with that's parish? what you're talking about west parish yeah. yeah yeah he was amazed yeah. yeah no it's i i've been getting videos i've been getting messages of happy tears that like yeah. well you know students that um are now going after just about a month of instruction. They're mm -hmm. going to the device. They're voicing um, single words, starting to put two words together. So when you see that there, that language is there. It's it's the yeah. language was there. They don't have the ability to explain yeah. it. My son mentioned that you know, they would make outbursts at, like vocal. Like, you know, like they could. I'm like they can't communicate. Can you imagine how frustrated mm -hmm. they are? You know, like, and then you just just like make he, the consultant that we have coming in would love to like even go into classrooms and um like have the uh, the students try it and show yeah. like yeah. she feels like that's really powerful to mm -hmm. see and you have them kind of learn that of how awesome. to use the device. And yeah, it's exciting. Other questions or I do. <laughs> sorry. So I promise all my questions previous to this were all organic. This is the only thing that I sort of prepared and I usually try to send them to people beforehand. So you can absolutely say like, can I get back to you on this? Mm -hmm. That's not um, I'm really curious about the role of neuropsychs and outside testing in the evaluation process. Mm -hmm. um, in my role as a social worker and, and being part of many, many IEP meetings, 100% of my clients all felt like they needed a neuropsych. I hear it a lot amongst families. There's two concerns there for me, mm -hmm. that there is a lack of um, trust or a lack of, in our testing and our ability to sort of diagnose or recognize, you know, anything that's coming up for kids. And two, the equity Mm -hmm. in relation to that, mm -hmm. because not everybody can afford um, neuropsych testing. I do realize in the state of Massachusetts, we do, the district does have to pay for additional testing for a second opinion if they qualify. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding. So for an independent eval? Yeah. So the independent eval is, um, yes, we would pay for it, but we get, there's different rules and laws around Yeah. It, so. So I, I have it in the policy. I know that there is a, a way for families to access that, mm -hmm. but again, there's only so many people providing neuropsych testing. Insurance doesn't cover it. There are so it's, many. It's wait so the, wait the, 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 the and equity issues around that are infuriating to me. And this is why we really want to look at, do all of our schools have the same tools? Do they all have the same training? Do they have the training in which tools they need? Um, and because we want to really, and, and what referral questions are we asking? I think if we can at the very beginning talk about, here's a suspected area of disability, 
here's the questions we want answered and then have the evaluators be able to be more targeted and focused on answering those questions and knowing what they're looking for in right. the evaluations. Um, yeah, and I think, I would imagine that it creates a really sticky dynamic between the schools and families if they're bringing in testing from a neuropsychologist and the school not so, necessarily always agreeing with what's being said there. And so I guess that's the piece too that I would imagine there's a, there's a natural, I would, I would guess, a breakdown in could communication. Be. There could be. Yeah. Um, it's, we really need to have our own data and look at our own data. And oftentimes with an neuropsych, there are patterns that are similar, but not always. Um, so we always, when a student's on an IV, we always consider the results of an independent evaluation in part with our evaluation results and look to see if there anything that we're seeing that's in the, the evaluation that we need to consider and ask. I don't know if that answers your question. I can get into um, the equity piece. I hear what you're saying with that. Um, yeah, do you have it? So you don't have to have a normal site to get an IEP. No, so, no. so that's yeah. not necessary, but I don't think families do that. And I think families sometimes have a misunderstanding that if they have a neuropsych, it's like a, a ticket for an IEP, like a prescription. And it's not always because a, a neuropsych might say the child has dyslexia, right? Dyslexia is a very broad term. So then that comes to our, us and we do our, in, our, some additional testing to, to you know verify or go a little deeper or whatever. And it might find when you go through that flow chart that yes, they have dyslexia, but they are making effective progress. Right, so they don't need an IEP because we, our tier one instruction or interventions are strong enough that they're making effective progress. So, but I think part of and in priority four, we do talk about some um, in priority two as well mm -hmm. about teaching parents about the interventions that we have in place and how we can support students without just getting that magic IEP that has that myth of it's going to fix everything. Oftentimes, it helps a lot but it's not always the golden ticket, right? And so the neuropsych isn't a path to that golden ticket because it's not, that's not what it is. And I think there's some education in the community to know that. And so for parents to feel that they have to go out and pay all that money and get on a six month wait list for a neuropsych is kind of sad. It's not an equitable is issue. If they have concerns, they should reach out to schools. That there's a process in place, the child study process that we can go through and work with families and explain to them the types of interventions and supports we can give each student individualized to either go through the road to get an IEP or to go through the road of just better supporting a student without an IEP because maybe they are better supported with interventions that we can give to all, right? Yeah. So I think there's a lot of community education on I that. I think it's because state, it is. I mean, it's a state thing. I mean, I don't, I think it's across the state that yeah. families feel yeah. like. It, I don't think it's just Gloucester. So oh, I no, it's everywhere. It's very clear. It's everywhere. It is absolutely something that I think is a trend mm -hmm. um, across the state. Um, if we have strong tools and everyone knows how to use those tools and assessments, and we do a thorough job of looking at all the components and being able to report that out, um, that's how we establish that equity and establish that trust with families and ensure that is this what you're seeing is this what it's like looking at the whole picture mm -hmm. um so what i'm hearing is that from a if you're a parent who has a child in the thick of this subject you get information mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and if you don't you don't know all this goes along goes on with other families right you may know about it, but you don't know the process. So it sounds to me, when you say there's people can get information, mm -hmm. it sounds like we should figure out how to ensure. do a do a parent information session, no matter who comes. But we're doing we're that, not, right? Well, we, we try. Yeah. Yeah. And right. my that, point is that you know, looking at colleges and things, you can look up any information you want to know we, about how to do how you go on. and you look at ABC step. Is yes. there some presentation that people could access themselves. Yes, right. So we're like working. you just explained to us beautifully 
okay. it would be nice if that was a document or a, or a presentation so it, as a starting point. It is, we are working on creating um, a document within the special education manual that has live links to resources. We're also working on, go ahead, Amy. So beyond the, the manual, which is very helpful, but um, that committee that we have in that's connecting regular general ed and special education that, that we talked about, one of the things that they that came out through the survey is an MTSS, the multi-tier system of supports, right? And first having a better understanding what that means in our schools, because it is in all of our schools currently, it's implemented you know, at different levels, you know, in the elementary levels, they've been doing interventions for a very long time, right? So the MTSS is um, really stronger in the elementary schools. The middle school, they're going to tell you about the amazing things they're doing in a few minutes um, about integrating some multi-tiered system of support, right? So we want to, as a district, have a very firm hold of that and then do that outreach, community outreach, mm -hmm. and, you know, have a website that talks about it, have some information that a parent might have all of that to educate that we want to first unify where we are as a district and that's coming out of the work that we're doing of connecting general ed and special ed. you're absolutely right it's needed and it's coming not and fast enough but it's coming i and i would love any advice that or any advice or ideas on how to find the have get parents together to be able to like we've tried through the CPAC to do have some parent nights and um we have a speaker for executive functioning that I booked for this week for last night was last night or the night before last night. and and had three parents um, which was wonderful to have three parents but we want to have more so ideas on whether we can put it in the, the newsletters that we have an executive functioning speaker it's open to all any CPAC presentations are open to all families. It doesn't just, you don't need to just have a student with a disability. But also Everyone needs parents accept. don't even know an executive function. So, True. you know, I, I think there's 100% like, how do we make that a little bit more accessible? Because mm -hmm. yep. every kid struggles with executive functioning. Yeah, exactly. Every adult struggles with executive functioning. And a different title would we probably be good. It. We'll do it with right. a different title. I mean, of, yeah. How do you? Support your student with organizing and yeah. doing organize. their homework. <laughs> How do you mean you don't? I think it's that's a great suggestion, <laughs> though. Having a different title. How yeah. do you support your student with yeah. following directions and cleaning their room and <laughs> getting their homework done? But the one last thing I want to just I, I shared this with Ben, but the MTSS piece of the work that we do is so incredibly important. But parents are not being informed even when their kid is getting pulled out that's that's truly not happening like intervention yeah um yeah, when they're getting intervention because remember interventions happen either in or outside of the classroom they, but it's not intervention or, or right? just at all yeah, like right, right. like if, if, if there's a reason why your kid is having an intervention yeah. they that's not necessarily getting um communicated to parents and so what's happening is they might not realize like, oh, we're already doing all, like we're already right. implementing. Yeah. We're already recognizing that we're seeing some lagging skills and here's all the stuff we're, we're already doing. <laughs> they might not find that out until a parent-teacher conference it's a couple months into the school year. So I think that's part of that communication is like, hey, we recognize based on this benchmark testing that your kiddo needs a little bit of help in this area. So here's what we're doing about it. Like from the beginning. Right. I think part of that is, a for our elementary schools, it's like normal way of operating. Yes. So you don't actually in formula normal, normal way of operating, but it's very helpful for families to it's know both helpful. that we, we see this concern, and because of that, we might you know we are doing X, Y, and Z. Right. Yes. And that that's a, something I think. And yeah. it is a normal way to tell it at parent conferences, just like, just like you said. But that's yeah. November or October, it's end of October, yeah. right? Yeah. So that is late. It is late. Um, but it yeah. is it also normalizes it that it's uh, you know students go into intervention and come out of intervention. Yeah. It's just what they need. But I think parents yeah, would definitely really appreciate knowing when we're doing the good work. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Katie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you raising your hand for another second? I was if I could just make one comment. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll save it. I'll save it. I'll no, stay late. Do you want to share? I'll save it for another time. Thank you.
thank you for your helpful questions. All right. Thank Very you, much. Kate. And That's I think some sense. notes will make sense. Moving along. Just, for, just so folks know, I thought this was going to be the longer presentation, okay? Uh -oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now you need to give me more time next time. Well, it's probably not just some bad. Let's do another one. Do this. Okay. 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 Would one of you be so glad? I'm sharing it. Sorry. Thank you. I thought you wanted a break. <laughs> all right, here we go. Thanks. That's not too annoying. Okay, well, thank you all for having us. Um, I'm pleased to have Kate and Jess here to accompany me. They are really the stars of the show tonight, not me. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about our current strengths, um, some data that we are of, of what we've accomplished so far as to mid year. The testing reports are from January testing. Um, we'll talk about professional collaboration and some student engagement things that uh, we've been working pretty hard on that are going well. Um, so we'll start with uh, the strengths. Um, our literacy focus is where I get to make the big announcement. Uh, we successfully completed three pilots, three different products this year, Wit and Wisdom being one, Amplify being the second, and Study Sync being the third, unanimously. The staff selected Amplify as the chosen curriculum product. And um, kids, the majority of kids were also in favor of Amplify. There was a, a significant segment that chose one of the other programs, though the reasoning that came along with that was that it was the easiest. So we, we chose to say, okay, then maybe that's really not our priority. Um, so this, this Amplify was um, found to be, well, Kate will talk more about that, so I'm not going to take that away, but the, she'll talk about the strengths of the program why it was selected. Um, but we're very pleased to have done that, um, and we're now in the implementation phase. The, the staff got together the last week and identified what's needed for implementation, um, and they're, they're really excited to get it going on that. Uh, Social-emotional support is um, an area that all of us have been working on quite hard. We have about uh, seven plus, I think, different classrooms doing pilot trails curriculum, which is a K-12 curriculum that everyone's taking a look at. Um, and in, in addition to that, our adjustment counselors are phenomenal. Um, so the, the combination of, of support from our counseling staff, the curriculum that's coming in, um, and we'll talk a little bit about next steps that we're planning for the fall that will contribute to that as well. Our, our STEM and critical and creative thinking, uh, we've had some really dynamic things going on in the Science Center recently with aquaponics and stream tables. Um, I know this is later on in the presentation, but I'm sort of bursting. I, uh, this week we had, to, we had GMGI in doing um, DNA separation with the kids. And so they had, I got it in front of me, I can't even remember the word for electro, some sort of gel electrolysis. No, it's not quite well. The word's here, so you'll get to see it. Um, but uh, so they 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 are taking specimens and separating out to identify the um, the different DNA and, and make predictions about how uh, breeding would happen and what what the dominant traits would be of whatever it is they're working with. Um, so this week they were learning how, and next week they get to work with um, recently passed fish, the aquaponics project. So I, I, I was in there and seeing kids, you know, do you realize that kids don't get to do this stuff? And of course they're middle school, so they look at me and say, yeah, so there's no clue. 20 years from now, you will realize how amazing the things you got to do in this program were. So, so that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, our PACE program continues second year. Um, our, our PACE teacher is, is phenomenal, and he's begun not only just working with kids who land with him, but you know, floating around, connecting with kids at all times. Um, he's integ integrated some educational components, increased the reflection opportunities kids are having there. Um, so it's been a really welcome addition to how we address student behaviors. Arts. Um, We've already spoken about the musical that's going on. Our, our band is now 145 participants. Um, they're integrating with the K-5 kids. If any of you were at the concert recently, 
Um, it was amazing to see how respectful and enthusiastic and supportive our middle schoolers were for the, the young kids that were there performing. Um, and, and we just have a, a really exciting program. I'll be talking to Horace with uh, Carlos and Phil from high school to, to get that back into our program for next year. Uh, and finally, it's just overall growth. Um, the leadership team is focusing on um, the community culture, the learning, and how we continue to make strides with everything that we're doing. Uh, just as a reminder, we have three focus areas, and that's what we'll be discussing tonight, the improving student learning, working on student engagement, and professional collaboration. So all of these are critical aspects for us. So we'll start with professional collaboration with a, a picture of some teachers working in the 3D print lab on the November Professional Development Day. Uh, and these are just some of the things that we've got going on that have, that have been really helpful this year. So um, the first thing which you'll see in a minute is we have articulated our statement of instructional focus. That was one of our goals that came out of the um, system of support with the state. Uh, and our instructional uh, leadership team is, is focused on teaching and learning and they spearheaded the work on, on that focus. Our teacher leadership advisory this year is focused on the community and culture aspects of the student engagement. Our math curriculum team um, did sort of a parallel, but more targeted um, articulation of a vision for math. So one of the first steps in their implementation protocol was to, to make sure that they were all in consensus about what our vision is for math to inform how they're selecting the looking at materials and deciding on a program that will work for them. As, as I said, ELA reached an unanimous agreement on Amplify, and our house teams are continuing to focus on student success plans, community meetings, things that really help students integrate and feel connected to the school. So this is our statement of instructional focus that um, was derived from looking at over the past few years and, and the direction that we know we need to go in what are the very key things that we want to make sure that everyone has at the tip of their tongue? So it, 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 we wanted it to be not a wealth of things that, that are spread out so much that people can't focus on them, but really to, to identify here are the three things that we're going to do all the time and everything that we do is going to focus on. Um, so it's, it's first using data in a collaborative way, and that's at data teams, it's curriculum meetings, it's at house meetings, it's at the, it's at the leadership teams. Um, we are continuing training with universally designed instruction. And we work with Katie Novak again this year. Hope to do that again next year and integrating um, practices into instruction that help more kids access and have voice and choice and be built connection to what they're doing. Um, and the, the final part relates to a lot of the math and science work that we're focused on, which is critical creative thinking, problem solving being able to, to follow those iterative processes that are so important in science experimentation in the labs. Um, and then finally, literacy for all of our kids across all subjects. Um, the, the instructional leadership team in particular found um, what happened was we, we worked on this you know, loosely. I sort of had a vision um, and we facilitated, Kate and I facilitated at the ILT um, the discussion of, of what we would want to have included. They came up with a really close draft statement to what Kate and, and Amy and I had come up with. Um, that then the whole process then went to faculty and faculty took a look at uh, the goals we've been working on and, and put their input in, came back to ILT. We determined that the statement that, you, that I just read fit what the faculty was interested in, what ILT came up with um, across the board. But one of the things that came up in addition was that we wanted language because the next step is to really integrate students into this. Um, so if this is our instructional focus, what does that look like for students? How do parents understand what we're trying to accomplish? So this is the language that we will be um, spreading so it's pervasive throughout, just like our sales values. Everyone knows what those mean. The next thing is for everyone to know and understand our instructional focus. So it's about collaboration, having voice and choice, thinking critically and creatively, problem solving, and practicing reading, writing, speaking, and listening. This is, this should be everything we do. 
So I'm going to turn over to Kate at this point, who's going to give you an overview of our data and what's happening with instruction um, and intervention, instruction in, the, in all classrooms and also intervention. Thank you. Um, so we're going to just start with our student achievement and growth in ELA. Um, as Lynn mentioned, we had three pilots um, this year for our English curriculum. And, you know, that being said, we didn't necessarily teach the same standards we would normally teach at this point in the year because we were trying different units from different programs that addressed different standards. Um, but if you go through the slides, um, we are seeing some steady growth, but we have an upward trend um, at this point in the year. Um, when you look at the red bars in comparison to the blue, um, which is, is great um, at our data meetings. We actually sat down and looked at the individual standards to see where there was work and specific standards and identify priority standards at each grade level. Now that we've selected a curriculum, we you know, have certain standards we're going to have to go back and make sure we address because they haven't been addressed um, in the programs that we've gone through so far. So we want to make sure that there are no gaps. Um, so our teachers have already looked at that. They've identified where, what they need to teach next. And um, the new units that they're starting with in the new curriculum are the units that will address those standards that we still have yet um, to teach. So our hope is that these, <laughs> these trends will continue to go up by the end of the year. So hopefully um, when we come back in spring, we'll see even higher red bars in the weeds and exceeds. So yeah, if you wanna go through, we have a similar trend in grade seven um, with the meets and exceeds bar um, continuing to go up and our not meeting bar is going down. Grade eight has a little bit of a plateau um, which, you know, we're, we're looking at, um, something to note, the meeting and exceeding is lumped together. The number of exceeding expectations did increase from the meets, even though they're the same level. Um, historically, if you remember the MCAS scores in the fall, when we presented those, the grade seven scores were lower. So this really isn't a surprise. Um, but as we go through launching the new curriculum, we're definitely spending a lot of time looking at those standards and making sure that we're getting the kids to where they need to be. Is this the group that would have been sixth grade at the beginning of COVID? So they would have been, um, I believe, in fifth grade when everything shut down. So they would have started middle school in the whole pandemic setting coming back. So I do feel like that grade in particular um, was impacted just with the transition of coming to middle school um, in quite a different um, state of affairs. Um, you can see from the growth too, um, the way we separated this out, basically when you're looking at student growth, you're looking at how students' individual scores improve over time. And so you're comparing, giving the student a percentile score based on how their growth compares to other kids um, who have scored similarly or had a similar trend. Um, and we're looking at, basically looking at the trend of kids' growth from spring of 2022 to this winter when we last took the test. And so, when we look at that, we want uh, average growth is between 40 and 60 percentile. And so that would be the typical growth. And so these are the percentages of kids who have scored typical growth. Um, and then accelerated growth would be anything above 60%. Um, and then of course, low growth would be below 40 percentile. Um, and so that's the percentage of students who have low growth um, and that, of course, is something, you know, we would like to get our typical and accelerated growth above 80%. Um, so there is some work to do, but, you know, I feel very confident now that we've selected a curriculum. And when I talked to you about some of the features of Amplify that we were looking at specifically, um, you know, really to address the needs of individual kids, I think you'll see more growth just from our, you know, tier one instruction being each job through this new program. All right, so uh, our plan going forward uh, for improving student learning and literacy is that you know, we have started this new Amplify program. Um, we just started impl uh, uh, implementing it after break. 
Um, but in addition to that, we also are continuing our literacy intervention class, which was new last school year. And within that program, the students who've been identified, they are using the Read Naturally Live program to work on reading fluency, um, which will in turn um, help with their comprehension. And then the students will get into that later, but students are progress monitored and it's for one term. So one of the quarters they're in that literacy intervention class. Um, we have ongoing analysis of STAR 360. That's our, you know, our benchmarking system. Um, when we have our data means, we really look at the, like I said, the individual standards. And then we started conversations about what do these standards look like? How do we teach them? And then, you know, now that we have our new program, we'll be able to look and see how those standards are taught through that program. Um, and it's very exciting. Um, through our professional development, we have gone um, through Read Naturally Live training, um, not only in our intervention classes, but also with our special education staff. Um, we've had tons of training with Amplify. Um, literacy across the subject area continues this year. I've done a lot of training this year with our keys to literacy strategies. So with um, all the content area teachers, we've looked at main idea strategies. We've looked at how to take two column notes. We've done top down webbing. We've done uh, quick writes and how to integrate quick writes into curriculum so kids are writing much more across subject areas, um, which will help improve their writing fluency. And then um, we've had Katie Novak came for Universal Design for Learning. And we actually, when she, she did she come twice or just once? She did one time. Um, she we was. Were, <laughs> yes, I feel like I've had many sessions with her this year. Um, she has done a lot with literacy and universal design for learning. So we figured rather than layer something else on top, we would integrate all the literacy strategies that we've been going through and talking about how that fits into universal design for learning. Um, and then part of the professional development is that we belong to the Tiered Literacy Academy through the state. And it's, um, there are sessions for Amy and Lynn and myself to attend as leaders in the building. But then also I've been attending coaching classes, which you know helps me bring those strategies back to the teachers of all the content areas. Um, so it's been very exciting. This is just the first year. <laughs> um, part of the instructional vision and focus came out of this academy, that was part of one of our first things um, that we were doing. And then part of what I'm doing through that academy is also looking at our data protocols. So, you know, the way we run our data meetings and how to make them more efficient, more targeted to really um, look at, okay, here's, you know, a standard that's not performing as well. What can we do specifically? Here's some strategies um, to help improve it. The, this is the, the first year of the MTSS Tiered Literacy Academy is a planning year. So this, the rest of the staff has not been involved in it yet. But what we're looking at is the effectiveness of the assessments we're using, effectiveness of the data that we're selecting to look at, different ways to look at the data, not just achievement or growth, but typical growth grouped with accelerated growth. Those are some of the suggestions we've gotten from them. So we're really trying to find, make sure that we're looking at all the information appropriate information, most helpful information, and in a way that's beneficial for us to implement changes. So you actually just fed right into what my question was, was um, and this, I just, forgive me if, if I don't know this, but have coaches been integrated into middle school? The way that there are coaches- We have one giant coach. Right, well, that was my question. <laughs> are you she is the queen. Oh, the queen. Sorry. Yeah. No, I hear that. Because so, I know from years past, one of the one of the ways that the elementary schools leapt forward was through coaches, is my understanding, right? And bringing in coaches on the you know the different levels. And I know data meetings at the elementary level are with coaches, you know. So you know, you, you made you just sort of brought in coaches, and that's exactly where it was. So how, do, I mean, is there a thought of bringing in your one person? <laughs> um, so I'm wondering where the thought is on bringing in coaches or, you know, I mean, the levels are still not where we would want them to be. Um, and as that was such an effective strategy in the elementary schools, 
is that something that's being considered and where is that? So a couple of things that make um, um, a little bit different than middle school. One, um, coaches in addition, I mean, they play a lot of roles. One role they play that was hugely important and is hugely important it is they and the principal, they tell me our partners on focusing on instructional improvement. That's what they and so when you know, there's a school committee on Kate's position, um, and one of the partners is, is Lynn, the principal really has not had that partner, okay? Um, you know, and then the team hasn't had that, that, that role, okay? So that, and so that leadership that can, you know, sort of um, activate the other folks, this is principal's principal, on, on supporting just what we're talking about here. None of this stuff was, you know, not, not, not I should say that's what I mm -hmm. A lot of this has been going because of the addition of, of Kate and her role. And um, and so, and that includes, you know, more focus on uh, database instruction. That includes focus on interventions. That includes the curriculum, you know, um, uh, the reviews and now, you know, pilot, pilots and now, now, you know, adoption. So, and, and, and the reason that we have with the coaches, which to answer the good question directly, but there's different level of capacity around instruction at the middle school than the, than the elementaries. Whereas you have teacher teaching multiple subjects at the elementary, you know, you have specialization at the middle school, and you have a program leader as well. Okay, so the program leader plus Kate plus you know you know um, Lynn and some of the assistant principals, you know. And this can really serve that function together. Plus, you have an instructional leadership team as well, which is you know leading a lot of this work. So, um, I don't think it's necessary to have the, the, um, the you know, that, that level of coach, that specific roles of coaching, because you have a different structure and different approach to specialization. So, 100%, and I'm no expert in all the different roles, so I, I don't pretend to be. Um, and when I look at the school, you know, when I look at how what percentage of our students are meeting or exceeding expectations, it's below 50% in everything, as far as I see. So, and I know that's exactly what you're working on, right? That's exactly what you're here to tell us about what you're doing. So I'm just, you know, I'm just thinking for this my story, the history I know of Foster Public Schools. Yeah, I, I, I think it's really appropriate for, for, for the school community members yourself who are, you know. Ask what else or what more, right? You know, right. And, and, and you know, and and, um, and and part of that what more honestly is taking extra positions and on the operating, you know, and and, and, and in our budget, you know, we've already showed you and okay, you know, as we go further along, a lot of the positions, the most majority of positions, um, moved from extra to operating budget this year are are all million positions, right. you know? um, but those positions are you know. We, are, we have we already have the crucial instructional one in the, in the operating budget, but that's you know, the pace teach which we talked about, which is a real sort of behavioral, cultural, you know, sort of you know, position supporting students, right? And how long they integrate. Um, uh, it will be the the the, um, the assistant principal font next following year. Um, but there's also um, Sort of emotional learning um, allows us to do that as well. One of those positions. The two interventions. Two interventions. Sorry, two interventions. And one of our special education um, learning center teachers. So those yeah. are the four that are coming. We hope onto the back end. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So those are some of the so pieces. It's all related to us. That 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 can cement a lot of the work you see up here that, that the team's talking about. Yeah. Yeah, and, and to jump in too, like one of the things you know with our scores being where they are, is that we didn't have a consistent tier one curriculum. So having consistency across the grade levels and having consistent strategies from class to class is hugely important to be able to see the world of work to have the kids truly understand and learn. So, you know, in terms of our plan and going forward, you know, now that we have this literacy program, the really awesome thing is that all our English teachers were trained in wit and wisdom. So when we selected this, we know that this fits like, you know, wit and wisdom can kind of transfer right into Amplify. Um, we know the language that was used at, or being used at the elementary school, um, the different strategies. Um, and we know, you know we've 
been able to see what is kind of thought at each grade level. So we had this great background and really felt like there would be a nice transition um, with a lot of consistent approaches. And then now that we have this you know, new um, literacy curriculum in place, we can take some of the writing, um, you know, graphic organizers and strategies and bring them to the different content areas so that you know, they're using the similar approaches in <clears throat> science class and in social studies class. So, um, you know, we're excited to get that work going. It's not going to happen this year. Um, you know, when, when you implement a program, you know, the implement phase is at least three years just to go through that phase. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think I've heard it's, you know, more like five years before you actually see like a huge mm -hmm. um, difference in, in scores going straight up. But, of course, I'm hopeful that we're going to see them change overnight. Um, but yeah, in terms of why we chose Amplify, some of the most exciting parts of it um, that our team and our students um, really liked um, is that it was designed specifically for middle school. Um, as we know, middle school kids um, are a different breed. They're my favorite. I have always loved middle school. Um, and you know, the fact that it's designed for as well that online tools are very engaging. There's a lot of apps built in with the program, but there's also a fully paper version too, because we know that, um, you know, sometimes kids just have too much screen overload. And so all the texts are available in paper format. Um, so some questions can be online, but if kids want to highlight and annotate in a paper text, um, we have that option available. Um, the texts are engaging, they're appropriately challenging for middle school students. Um, they're given rigorous tasks um, that really get the kids thinking critically and going back in the text to find where they, you know, where that answer um, is in the text, but also what clues might help them for an answer. Um, there's explicit writing instruction built in. Um, there's direct language standards taught, and um, our most probably most exciting piece was the embedded differentiation and support. So, kind of following Katie's presentation, um, you know, as we're looking to meet the needs of all kids, you know, we find that any kid is struggling with a certain type of prompt. Um, the teacher has the ability within the program to, you know, decide what level of support that student needs. And all of a sudden on that student's screen, a sentence starter might pop up, or maybe it can, gives them a little hint as to what paragraph to go to, to find the answer. Um, if they're writing a paragraph, maybe a little graphic organizer pops up. Um, and then also there's, um, there's a challenge piece to it too. So if a kid um, is ready for more, <laughs> we can add you know, um, enrichment piece to it as well. Um, and the kids all have, it's different. Nobody knows what they have um, in terms of their level of support and it can change on the spot. If teachers see the whole class is struggling, they can turn it on for everybody. Um, with our implementation process, we've just launched this curriculum, like I said, a couple of weeks ago. Um, we are um, still in the training process. We, um, tomorrow, actually, I'm going to be training all the ESPs on how they can support the students with this new program in the classrooms. And then we'll have a training for our special education teachers um, on the 21st, I believe. And then as we you know, look forward to next year, there'll be a lot of professional development time dedicated to really unpacking this program and you know, how to best meet the needs of our kids using it. Um, we also need to have coordination with our K-5 teachers um, and, you know, looking at, you know, is there, you know, we know wit and wisdom, they don't know, necessarily know Amplify. Um, and then also looking at GHS and if there's, you know, different, you know, vertical things that we need to take care of. Are you finding that the texts are both diverse and inclusive? That's one thing that I loved about Wit and Wisdom. I continue to love about Wit and Wisdom. I know it all kind of conversations. Yes, and, and they're very clear mm -hmm. that they're reading very diverse texts. Yes, and um, that was one of our priorities in terms of looking at curriculum. So, in the English department, at a thing that teachers at a really good Good. Um, uh, 
it's just something I can say, but we're just on this. First, I'm very excited about this. Okay, so I'm going to try to contain my enthusiasm for a moment. But um, so a couple of things. One, uh, some similarities and some differences with the implementation taking on the ELA curriculum at, at middle school versus elementary. Okay, one similarity is deep teacher involvement. Okay, um, which is you know from the very beginning designed you know with, with that in mind and because it's crucial to only level. Okay. I also love obviously the student involvement, which really was different at the, at the elementary. The difference is the pace, you know, in terms of taking it on. Um, folks rightly asked, asked us last year, why the heck would you take three years to take on a curriculum at the elementary school? Okay, we have good reason for that. We explained them to you. Um, that made a lot of sense. But here, you know, the pilot was fat, fast, still in three, you know, not as deeply, but that was okay, but still got a good sense of what they were, and the students did too. Um, but because it's just English teachers, we can actually start then, as Kate just described, taking it on this year for the um, uh, you know in, you know in terms of in terms of implementing you know whereas we, you know we're having multi multi year process. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Particularly because all all of the English teachers, every single one was part of the pilot. So it, it wasn't a question of a couple of people doing one thing or another. They all did all of the products, and then so they all experienced it. So it makes it a yeah. somewhat easier transition. It's a, and it's a crucial piece of yeah. involved. Where the elementary, we can't have them all involved. No, um, so this year we have a lot more folks involved, um, and then the last group will be involved next year. So anyway, just similarly of, of teacher, you know, inclusion, collaboration, and leadership on it, um, supported really well by administration, Kate, um, Amy, and Lynn. Um, and now we're moving ahead. And stuff. And stuff. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was great. Um, well, the last piece on this is I'll say is that there's a lot of values for having a common curriculum in, in, in a in subject area at the middle school um, and high school, too. But in, in middle school, another one is the, um, the community of practice. It's one thing for teachers in the same grade or same subject area to talk about the work they're doing and, and the teaching they're doing and the struggles they're having. But when they're not teaching the same things, that's it's a good conversation and really helpful. When they're teaching the same curriculum, that goes to a whole other level about you know, talking, communicating, thinking about their practice, you know, um, you know, just strengthening it, working together, to strengthening it, and, that, and that's um, that has just benefits in lots of ways, school culture, but also benefits the students because their practice just it sort of it sort of builds on each other. So that's a that's a not an often an obvious benefit, but it's a huge benefit. We're really excited that that the team has is, is had as teachers are taking the step. Really big step And they're excited about it. Yeah. So watch Kate and Steph lead the the group and have the thoughtful discussions they had about whether you know literature and teaching and instruction and homework and all the things that you know you don't always get excited to hear and to go uh, last week and hear about how excited they are to implement. And they were you know, asking questions like, how are we gonna support them with professional development? And they're putting in their calendar a day in the summer that they're gonna come in for a training and they are ready to go. And it was led wonderfully by Kate and Steph and um, I'm really excited to see where it goes. And Lynn too. Yeah, I think I'm <laughs> and I, I really, I wanna publicly thank that whole English team because yes they did so much work I and mean, to learn one new program is a huge feat but to learn three and then implement them with fidelity um, and switching gears um, and, and helping to make it seamless for the kids um, and, and make sure that the kids are getting the best out of out of the curriculum and of, out of the you know their day um, you know I just I was super impressed by everything that they they did. They worked incredibly hard. Now we'll brag on it. Yeah. So are you ready for math? <laughs> <laughs> Try to keep it, keep it short. Okay. So math. Um, again, similar trends. We are going up um, in our our data. Um, not as high as I would like to see it going up at the midpoint in the year. Um, so this is sixth grade. And then let's see, seventh grade and then eighth grade is very similar. Our percentages are a little off because of the rounding with the tenth. I should have put in uh, the numbers to the tenth, but um, 
you know, what this is showing us is that our curriculum that is currently in place probably, you know, it's, it's something that we need to look into, which is why we've started the math curriculum review um, because we want our scores to be higher. Um, and so this is really, you know, an indication of our tier one curriculum needing to be um, strengthened. So we can go on to the next slide. So, which again, similar trends. Um, this is our you know, low growth. Eighth grade is showing very low growth at this point in time. Um, so that's something that we're focusing on. At our data meetings, we have pulled all the standards reports and looked at the standards um, to see what are the upcoming units that we're going to teach and how we're going to change things to try to get it so that the students are meeting those standards. <clears throat> Um, but, you know, really, it, it does come down into, as to what we're using for, I think, the curriculum, um, which we'll talk about as we get. For both the ELA next. and math, when we implement a new program, like Kate said, it takes a good three years for it to be take effect. What we might, hopefully, we'll see sooner is the growth change to typical and higher, right? They might not meet be, be, be benchmark as fast as through implementation, but we want to speed up the growth. That's what we could you know, and, look for. And one thing to like, Can I ask a question oh, sure. before you want. So, how are we monitoring it? Because that's been a question I've been thinking about since you've been talking. We have our benchmarks, but but what, where's the accountability to get to the benchmark? So as opposed to waiting another year. You know so what I mean? Do like, you want to take a look? Yeah, so we give that star 360 is three times a year. We give it the yeah. September, January, and the end of the year. And then we do um you know, there's a unit test through the curriculum, um, and in this case, Big Ideas is what we use for math. Um, so there, are, you know, they give the test, they look at the test, did the kids master the standards? What didn't they master? Or, you know, then they go back and they might, you know, do some extra reteaching. They might group the kids different ways to, you know, focus on different skills, and then, you know, reassess them to see if they mastered that standard. So. Um, you know, it's something that teachers will do constantly, you know, the progress monitoring through through their instruction. Um, you know, unit test is more of like a, a bigger assessment, but they do, you know, formative assessments daily um, just to check to see how the kids are mastering. And we have the support for our teaching staff to do that. We, yeah, it's a lot. It is a lot. And so that's something, you know, obviously, you know, when we're looking at improving student learning, um, one of the things, you know, when we were talking about coaching, um, we do have our program leads. And, you know, obviously I'm one person, I can't go to every vertical team meeting at, at once, but we usually pick where, where is it I'm most needed? Where is it Lynn is most needed? Um, but I know that um, Michelle Bailey, our math department lead, um, is really good at bringing an instructional strategy, whether it's you know building mathematical thinking, she'll bring it. She'll have some sort of article. She'll have the teachers try it at her meeting, and so she kind of takes on that coaching role through that vertical team meeting. So um, it's neat through the math curriculum review committee. We do have representatives from every grade level, and so you know all those you know, questions are part of, you know, what we've been talking about, and then they go back to their curriculum teams to, to involve everybody um, to ensure that there's consistency in how they're, you know, teaching and reteaching. And whatever program we end up going with, you know, there'll be more professional development that goes along with that. So it's, it's going to be a long process. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, so yeah, our curriculum review for math is underway. Um, we are following the implement process, which is, you know, the first phase is to, to learn um, as much as you can, you know, digging deep into what's the history of the math curriculum at O'Malley, how did it get chosen, digging deep into our data, um, looking at what's currently in place for practices, and then coming up with our priorities um, and perimeters for selecting a curriculum. Um, through that process, as Lynn mentioned, we developed an instructional vision, um, which we'll show you um, on the next slide when we get there. Um, and that will kind of drive our whole process in terms of where we want to be. And clearly where we are now isn't where we want to be. So whatever we select, we'll be going through that lens, sort of the first filter. Um, 
This year, we implemented our tier two math intervention class. So this is in addition to having um, the general education math class. Um, students are selected based on their Star 360 score, um, teacher recommendation based on classroom data. Um, and you know we looked at MCAS at the beginning of the year, but um, they will go to that tier two class. And in that um, intervention class, they use Freckle, which is connected to Star 360. So it pulls the data from the benchmark and then it goes back and kind of gives kids extra support and extra practice on those different skills. Um, and then there's a lot of interactive um, instruction in that class. Um, the kids are in there for one term. We reevaluate using data at the end of the term, see how the kids are doing. If they come out, uh, lots of kids come out and then a whole new group comes in. And then uh, to follow up on a question earlier about notifying parents, we do, I email every parent um, and I use Kimbo. <laughs> uh, so they kind of get a double, double notification. And then, you know, a lot of parents will, you know, respond back, thank you so much, or we'll end up having a conversation as to, you know, in more depth as to why a student was placed in there. But um, we do uh, try to give every parent that uh, notification um, and conversation. And then um, in terms of professional development, we've been really exploring, like we mentioned, thinking strategies that Michelle will bring to those vertical team meetings. We also um, are doing, we're going to start a book study on building thinking classrooms in mathematics. And um, Amy was <laughs> great just enough. I think we bought them for everybody on the team and anyone who had wanted them. And then um, the universal design for learning that the whole school is doing will benefit math. And then I'm part of the DESE implement team with Lynn and Amy and Michelle. Um, and that's all meetings collaborating with other districts in the state who are going through a very similar process. So the next slide. The teachers heard. asked for that book study. Yes. It was either you or Michelle brought one article from the book and they said, we want the whole thing. And I said, well, I'll get it. Yeah, which goes into like when we developed the instructional vision, we didn't just like come up with it. We um, did a lot of research. So mm -hmm. I brought parts of that book. We looked at articles. We dug deep into the Massachusetts state framework and what the state says good solid path instruction looks like. And then we actually demonstrated um, vertical learning surfaces and went around and wrote on the wall. We had like special um, paper that you could write on and wipe off. And, um, so what we ended up coming up with um, once we did our research, went back and talked to the math department. We also opened it up to our special education teachers and our, our L teachers um, to get all stakeholders involved. We were able to come up with the statement of where we want to be with math instruction, which is that students engage in mathematical thinking, collaborative discourse, and reasoning, and problem solving in order to develop a deep understanding of concepts and mastery of skills to grow into independent and curious learners. So this is more specific to math, really focusing on, you know, looking at their, you know, there are several different ways to solve a problem. We're not gonna just, you know, focus on one way, but I'm gonna tell you how I came about solving mine. And then, you know, Lynn's gonna tell you how she solved hers and we can, you know, collaborate and figure, you know, out that there are multiple ways of of doing things. So just to, um, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. um, do you still have advancement? Yes. One of the things that we'll look at through the review is how the students are placed in different levels for that um, and taking a, a real solid look at the way that we compact the curriculum currently and whether there's a, a benefit to switching to a model that keeps the kids more horizontal in terms of um, concepts and skills, but goes deeper. So in other words, expanding horizontally when kids are at the different levels as opposed to moving them faster through the curriculum. <clears throat> There's some questions about whether the fact that you move kids through multiple books and at a faster pace in order to get them to have the whole curriculum so that they can take algebra one and eighth grade, whether that's the most effective way to do instruction many places choose not to do it that way and spend more time deepening the understanding more more extensive number theory for example as opposed to going farther ahead 
with different topics. So that will be taken into consideration as we it yes. also affects what they take. So, yes, uh, of what they're able, able to take. Able to take they can be successful with. So, so they yeah. may take the course, but not have the depth of understanding that supports them as they get into the more sophisticated math courses at high school. So it works for now, but we want it to be sustained, deep, retained, learn. Um, so just as an overview, as, as, as before we continue, um, the curriculum reviews are about the care one, tier one instruction. So that's making sure that all kids are receiving instruction with curriculum that, that is um, that provides equity, provides access, allows the flexibility to, um, to meet different kids' needs at different times. And that's the focus you heard Kate talk about, amplifying the benefits it has. The, you know, the technology tools do help significantly with regard to being able, being able to turn on a dime in the class and make changes and change what the kids are, are having access to. Um, the second piece, which we'll talk about in a minute, is the response to intervention. Those are the, the two interventions we currently have, MAP and ELA, um, and we're planning for um, moving into SEL in the fall. So as part of MTSS, it's not just literacy and math, it's also social emotional learning. So that'll be our next phase of entry in the fall. Um, and then finally, this the scaling to maximize subgroup growth, including special education and a lot of these things. For example, the read live tool that we started using in, in intervention for literacy last year is now being used among all of the grade levels in the special education academic support so we've got a tool that we found that worked and now it's being expanded so that there are more students that are taking advantage of having access to an effective instructional tool specifically for fluency on this topic um, this is a refresher kate's mentioned it um, the data teams are still going strong we have incorporated special ed teachers and invited them to those meetings this year and the, the L teachers as well. Um, and it continues to really serve us to have STAR 360, have classroom data, to be looking at STAR in particular, gives us information about individual standards. And that's really, that analysis is really what impacts, um, what can impact what we're doing with kids to target instruction. Um, one of the things that came up this year was our, our weakness previously with nonfiction texts um, and some of the, the pilot materials that were used focused on nonfiction texts and our kids grew with that. So it, it's exciting to be able to see, to identify something that you know isn't working currently to put something in place that has that instruction involved and then to be able to see progress for that really quickly. Okay. This should be hopefully very quick because I've already talked about literacy and math intervention. So um, basically we have them for both classes. The average class size is around eight students. Some are a little smaller, some go up to about 12 students. Um, there are 30 to 35 students enrolled per grade, per term, and per subject. So um, students take their intervention class as a specialist class. Um, they still go to their, you know, use of class or their uh, PE class, um, you know, or art or whatever else they have scheduled. Um, but they do go to the intervention for a 40 minute block, six times a day, uh, or six times a week on that six day cycle, <laughs> um, not six times a day. Um, we select the students in a similar process for English as we do for math, but I um, explained how we look at star data, we look at classroom data, um, we notify the parents. Um, when the students are in the class, we progress monitor them using the star 360. Um, we also do additional literacy assessments. We use the Dibbles for um, the literacy intervention. So we do the oral reading fluency and we do the maze. Um, with the math, um, I believe there's a little progress monitoring through Freckle. Um, and then some of the teachers are also giving an additional start assessment. For example, I think this week in grade is doing a sort of a mid or mid trimester, I guess, um, administration of the start. So they, they had the January, early January, now they'll out of the mid March to see how things are going so that for the rest of the year, they know what to work on until June. No, sorry. Um, and then, ah, 
we talked about kind of what we do in each of the different classes already, but um, another important part is that the teachers of the intervention conference with the kids and kind of talk to them about what their focus areas are, kind of give them a success plan. And then at the end of the term, they go over sort of that decision, like, okay, you know, you're ready to graduate out because we've seen growth on these specific skills or, you know, we've seen growth on these skills, but we still want to see growth on these skills. So we're going to stay in one more term. Uh, so you know, letting the students be part of that process as to why they're there and what their focus areas are to help them grow. Um, the good news is, is we've seen growth. <laughs> um, not as much growth as I'd like to see, but um, part of that is through our MTSS Literacy Academy. We're going to be um, using some of our resources there to really focus on what is happening in our intervention classes and to really make sure that we're maximizing the growth of those kids when they're in there for that one term. And hopefully, only keeping them in their one term. Um, but we're looking at, you know, the green bar is the uh, intervention class um, versus the blue bar is the students do not enrolled in intervention. Um, so that bar is higher. Um, you know, I'd like to see the, the green bar be above 60 um, because we want more of that accelerated growth um, in that class. And then if we go to the math, we can see that um, if we're looking at the, I'm just comparing the average to the median, it's two different types of looking at it, but the math uh, intervention class is seeing that growth um, about 60. Can you add something um, to look at that accountability? So here, what you see is um, there's different levels of growth between math and literacy intervention, okay? Um, the math interventions are, are really following with, quite, with great fidelity program that, that they're following that, that they're you know that they're and, and the techniques they're using that they, they develop and, and literacy is not doing that as much okay so the accountability comes in noticing through the data what's happening here why isn't you know uh, the growth where we want it for literacy and then work with the teacher to say you know, what's going on are you doing this okay we've got to do this you know more fidelity we've got to really stick to the program so that and then accountability comes from Lynn comes from you know paid supporting and, and that's happening well, but for knowing the data and following the results. That's something that we need to know that the team's working on. That's my last slide. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next section is student engagement. We're going to turn over to Mr. Bestito. Thank yep. you. So, my part is next. So, student engagement, um, and there's just a few slides on this, but uh, when we think about you know student engagement at the middle school level, it's maybe the first time that you know we're truly asking kids for voice uh, and making some decisions. And the good work, hopeful good work that we do at the middle school is going to capture, you know, and invite and continue that engagement at the high school level. The elementary is, I'm sure, there's some of it, but you know, depending on the age and grade, you know, it's, it's mostly adult driven some student led activities. Um, this year, and you know, the last few years for that matter. Um, we really put an emphasis on, you know, student voice um, and involvement. So here's just a list, and I'll just go down them with brief descriptions. If there's questions, you know, feel free to ask um, about what, you know, we have asked students to do or students have asked of us to have them have more voice in. Um, and simple things to dynamic things. So recess choice, um, COVID kind of changed a lot for us with the way that we held recess. Some of us really liked those changes. Um, the kids didn't uh, for the most part. And so we surveyed the kids and essentially what the kids wanted to do is go back to being with their entire grade for lunch and recess. Uh, COVID forced us to you know, keep kids away from each other, separate, so on and so forth and cohorts and whatnot. We liked it at a, for a visibility and a safety level. Kids for the most part didn't like it, uh, except the ones that don't like noise and we're dealing with that a different way. Um, so, uh, sixth grade still, is that true? Sixth grade? Yeah, sixth grade still uh, is split uh, by choice. Seventh and eighth grade um, are together by choice. Um, dance guidelines is also a new one. Uh, COVID ended our dances or suspended our dances, I should say. Um, it, you know, we've had two dances this year. The Halloween dance is always heavily well attended costume. It's, it's fun. Um, 
we needed to set some new parameters and guidelines uh, to I'll just be direct to avoid the chaos. Um, kids, parents, teacher complaints, so on and so forth. Um, we got considerable student voice, um, and we we're fortunate in the sense that their voices uh, often echoed what we had hoped they would say. Uh, we had some behind the scenes guidelines and then some things that we obviously you know, weren't willing to part with just for safety. Um, and for the most part, the kids uh, echoed all of those things. Uh, we, we had one, the second dance last month, not as well attended, it was, I don't know, what was it? Winter themed, spring oh, something. It was confusing. There were still a lot of kids there. Yeah, I actually, yeah, Ben was there, that's true. Yeah, yeah, there, there was, there were, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so the photo booth was a big hit, but. Um, so and then obviously Kate, you know, and others have, have spoken specifically about the ELA, uh, ELA curriculum, but kids had a voice in that. Um, and, uh, you know, I can't think of another example where kids, you know, have had that much of an impact on curriculum, you know, not a unit that we might teach in a classroom or a topic that we might talk about, but high level, you know, this is yeah. what your year is going to look like. They'll, they'll have some input into um, some of the structures of the schedules in terms of 40 minutes versus 80 minutes based on this year compared to last year. So, yeah, yeah, uh, <clears throat> which was which is nice. So it'll be uh, interesting to see, you know, what the current sixth and seventh graders you know, think of it over the next couple of years. You know, the eighth grade will move on, but um, it, you know, we'll we'll keep track of it, keep asking, but it's that that piece is exciting. Um, sales council is something that's not new to us, um, but you know, new group of kids. Some kids have done it in the past, but you know, it, it is you know, obviously our messaging and, and what we embrace as a school community, and you know, kids are you know pretty regularly coming up with. You know things that embrace you know what that acronym stands for um, and you know it's again one of those examples where kids are having you know the ability to have a have a voice and a say and it invites them to school often it keeps them there sometimes it's an after school commitment that their initiative has you know spurred um, and it gives them an incentive to come so new uh, this is more i think probably in Maybe the parents are on this uh, site council, but two eighth grade reps on site council, um, which I think is fantastic. So similar to Kaya, you know, coming on, Marvellis coming on, you know, these two eighth graders who are, you know, mature and um, you know, have the ability to have a plan, follow through, listen, be heard. You know, it's it's you know they came in as leaders, but they're learning leadership skills and you know. Um, in high school, hopefully that will continue for us. Yeah, they've been, we just started at this at the last meeting. They were on the hot seat almost the whole time. They handled it. Because mm -hmm. so, everyone at the table is looking at them for advice. What do you do? So we're, we're working through the handbook. So they've got a lot to say. It's awesome. Uh, yeah. uh, we have two student reps on the principal search committee. Uh, those two kids were, uh, our students were elected this week. Um, so one of them, they're both seventh graders. One of them is in the play, which the, our first committee meeting is, is Friday afternoon. And I had said to her, I said, you know, remember, no is an appropriate answer. Like, you do not have to do this, but here's what it entails. And she looked right at me and she said, I can make it work. And I was like, all right, like, great. You know, I'm like, you do realize, like, it's Friday, and then you got to go right to the play. She's like, I'm good. Don't worry. So I conveyed that to her mother, and her mother's like, oh, yeah, that's how she is. So, um, so it, you know. I think their insights, you know, in the day-to-day -day business of being a kid uh, on that committee is, is going to be invaluable. Um, so community meeting is the next one. So uh, Dennis Hurley, the current sixth grade um, assistant principal has brought this from a previous district he worked in. But the idea is simple um, and it's, it evolves and it's, it's flexible by, by its nature, but community meeting is, is meant to have student voice. It's meant it, uh, ultimately to be student led. Um, and it talks about things within the house setting and at times maybe grade level or you know the larger community. Um, but it really is to echo the good things that the kids are doing. It's not meant to be you know uh, unitive conversation. We try to do those in different, different settings, not as large. Um, so uh, the sixth grade has has had some good momentum. Seventh and eighth, we're getting there. Um, but you know I think 
the kids see value in it. And I think with teachers, while some hesitant at first to take the responsibility away and give it to the kids, um, I think we are starting, hopefully starting to see some of the you know, leadership letting kids alone. Um, the next one is Cherry Street Journal. Kids um, were very influential in creating a website. I don't know, it comes out. The journals are whatever. whatever they decide. Yeah, exactly. That's what I thought. I didn't, I didn't think it was, uh, you know, they, they weekly or monthly. We yeah. ramped yeah. this year, though. We didn't have a Cherry Street Journal on a website. And they um, worked with a couple, actually, the teachers had access and they gave them the access and they created the whole thing. And they are constantly in conversation about what needs to be updated on it. So yeah, there's uh, incredible excitement, and it's you know, you know, um, the journals. It, it's middle school. You know, the, the articles are funny. They're like mostly well written. You know, <laughs> like you know, the kids did it, and it's um, the topics are interesting. So can you see them? They're on the website. Yeah, they're they're on the website. Website. If you go to the front page, just the only yeah. website. Okay. There's a link to Cherry Street Journal right there. Okay. Keep this one. I I think I can share. Right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll just bring it up. Just keep, keep going, Jeff. Right. Hold on. Okay. I think, okay. I think, screen. I think the next one was, uh, the, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, student MCs at our student led performances. So, band concerts, um, the kids led it completely. Carlos was there, but no one saw him. Um, I think he might have been in the sound room. Oh, thank you. Um, and, you know, the band is spectacular for one. Um, so just to be there in their presence and their talents is amazing. But then to have the kids be introducing one another and the one that happened last month, there was some, you know, like dad jokes in it. And it was, uh, it was good. The kids got the ability to kind of step out of a classroom, you know, traditional classroom setting and uh, step up and be heard. And it was, it was really fun. Um, just, just oh, so, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, the charity journal's up there. Um, you can get it just by from our mailing website, just go down a little bit, but it is filled with all those things. Yeah, right. Really quite picture. an elaborate menu structure right. that they've set up. It's quite mm -hmm. fantastic. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's a great website. So, but, you know. And then the, the last one on the slide. So, Learning to Lead is a student leadership conference. It's at the, the end of the month in March. Uh, the middle school version is at Essex Tech. Uh, ben brought it to our attention you know, last week. So, there's going to be 15 O'Malley kids in all three grades, 15 total um, attending. So, it's you know uh, really meant to develop leadership skills. It's meant to, uh, and it's an interactive uh, workshop, not just you know adults talking to kids. They're going to you know. Uh, be involved heavily, hopefully. Um, and the idea is, you know, it's decision making, it's uh, making choices about, you know, today that'll impact your future and so on and so forth. So the APs have been going around, the guidance with the guidance counselors helps help to pick kids. And it's, you know, again, it's similar to the principal search committee. They're like, mm, I don't think so. And then we give them the information. They're like, yeah, I'm into this. So we'll see. Uh, we're in the final stages of you know, reaching out to families to get confirmation that, you know, on permission and then the transportation piece. And like I said, it's at the end of the month. So that should be exciting. Um, so student engagement within the context of community culture and uh, restorative practices. Um, so again, the sales council, um, you know, deals with that very topic. You know, they're, they're uh, less on the academic side of things they're more on the you know social emotional and the things that we do as a community that makes communities you know really good um lynn had mentioned uh, earlier the you know the trails sel pilot so advisory and trails so advisory is again like talking to kids about making good decisions at times it is talking about the bullying you know curriculum that is mandated but it's it the intent always is to become more uh, organic. There's a curriculum, but it's conversations. It's having kids comfortable, having at times difficult conversations, but also hearing your peers, uh, being able to listen, but potentially disagree, have those discussions and, you know, um, start to understand, you know, what it is to be, you know, a citizen within the, you know, our school community, but what it means in a greater scale. 
um, community meetings again. So the Cracker Jack Award, just like you know, uh, in the Cracker Jack box, is you know, a prize within, right? They give out, you know, or we give out to Cracker Jack Awards to kids that have like really excelled, you know, uh, shown tremendous growth. And it doesn't have to be an academic thing. It might be. It might just be that they're just doing something, uh, you know, out of the ordinary that is really appreciated by the staff or the kids. You know, we, we want to make sure that they get recognized for that. Um, this year, sixth grade did a team building day or uh, humor stage by house beginning of the year. Strong emphasis to build relationships with kids like, on day one. Right, that's not new, but I think coming out of COVID, you know, kids have been so closed in. Staff too, for that matter. Um, really getting to know our kids as soon as possible in a deep, genuine manner um, makes all the other difficult work, curriculum content, testing, you know, that you know, teachers, staff have to do that much easier. Um, so this was a lot of uh, like you know project adventure light type stuff, not only the high element stuff, but the, the ground stuff. Uh, you know, collaborative work, problem solving, uh, things like that. Uh, Spirit Week is on the horizon. Uh, that includes a, uh, which has always been uh, very well attended. Uh, the faculty student dodgeball game. So the grade level that wins the student on student dodgeball games then competes against the staff. Um, yeah. 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 So I know this is being recorded, but I don't think the staff has ever done Ever. <laughs> so I just I don't know where I'm going with that. Where I want that to like with like. But they've never won. Are you on the team? I, um, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I signed up for crowd. Yeah. Um, so there's that. So essentially, what this is. So this is it. In a trad traditionally, it came out of our Matt March Madness. Um, you know, kind of student-led, student-centered mm -hmm. initiatives, which are week-long after-school activities to get kids that otherwise aren't part of an after-school program. You know, to stay after school and you know make connections. Um, so, you know, and I think the kids, once they really understand that they're going to be throwing dodgeballs at staff, they're like, I mean, where's that? You know, um, it's pretty easy to get their attention. The next one uh, house decorating contests um, kind of start as a holiday thing. No, it is a holiday thing. And some houses uh, really, really taking it very seriously. And, you know, it is. We appreciate that the fire department hasn't come through in those weeks uh, <laughs> because the, the walls, the ceilings, the hallways, the lockers. We, we did have to take down some decorations the following day this year because they set off the motion detectors. So the alarm went off. There were too many snowflakes floating around. So, yeah. so, um, but, you know, yes, at the end of it, there are, you know, uh, awards, but it's, I, I really do genuinely, and I'm not just saying this, I genuinely think it's, it's, there's a piece that it's about that, but it's about the recognition and it's about the teamwork that the, really the kids, we hope, are, are doing. Staff definitely gets involved in it, but the sixth grade especially, but a particularly competitive group as adults, and I think the kids just absorb that naturally. Healthy <laughs> company. Uh, yeah, it was, they were impressive, quite impressive. So this next one, um, I could talk for like three hours on it about how impactful it's been for us uh, in a positive way. Um, and it speaks to some of the stuff that's been brought up earlier, actually, which is nice. So PACE, right? So alternatives, uh, consequences. So really what that means, like in a nuts and bolts kind of scenario is like, we're suspending kids less, right? And if that's all we did is just suspended kids less and put them in this room, like that's a game, right? But we're doing considerably more. So Jude Seminara is the sole instructor in that program, special ed background, you know, and behavioral background. Um, and loves it, like loves the challenge. And it, it is, it is, it's challenging work. It's oftentimes the kids that are coming into these programs are being kicked out of class, right? They're no longer, or I should say it this way, they're disruptive enough to the to their peers for a sustained amount of time that it's making a negative impact, right? Uh, and the piece that's essential, there's two pieces really, the 
there's the self-reflection for the piece when the kid is ready. Because if you're like, you need to self-reflect now and they're you know irritated, they're gonna get a very irritated response. There's no self-reflection. But once they've calmed and are in a safe space and feel that that room is a trusting space where they can work and get what they need, uh, the reflections that come out of it are fairly insightful at times, right? Um, so yes, on paper, we have a reduction in suspension, which is all well and good, right? The state likes that, all of that. Again, if that's all we're doing, like we look better statistically, but kids are in school, meaning they're not being sent home, right? They're, for the most part, actively engaged in their learning while it's mostly independent, right? Um, Jude is, like I said, special ed and he's a previous so history teacher. So he's got plenty of backgrounds with teaching and helping and all that, you know, the supports. And then it's, you know, if, you know, a teacher's available or if like one of us needs to come down and just do a check-in or, um, you know, some restorative piece, they're there. You don't have to wait for the next day or five days or try to get the parents to come in to you know, do this big to-do meeting. It happens more fluidly. And you know we are seeing considerable impact in. You know, granted, we still have plenty of behaviors, but we're seeing kids go, calm down, and be able to leave and reintegrate into, uh, you know, the general ed classroom at a much faster pace than we would if we were suspending them outside of school. Can I just say one quick thing about that. Yeah. There's two things that I think just speak to the values of Boston Public Schools, right? These programs, one, like, every kid is a good kid and every kid has a hard time, sure. right? Like, that's just a value base. Like, you're a good kid, having a hard time, period. And just because you're having a hard time doesn't mean that you're a kid out of the community or that you're isolated mm -hmm. and that your feelings are not scary to us and that we can help you work through those feelings in a safe, contained place the trusted adult and that we're not going to push you away because of those big feelings and that to me is like that's community building that is like creating safety that is creating meaning out of all of the hard things that is life and those things are just going to follow those kids throughout life forever and i think it's just so incredibly important everything you talked about that to me is like that's it so thanks and it, it's there's a ton of effort and support behind it. It's not any one. I mean, Jude is the face of it, but yeah. you know, it's it really collaboratively with a lot of staff. Yeah. yeah. So then, the yeah. you know, this isn't in there. I mean, it's in the title. But so these restorative practices, right? Like, um, you know, I, I, I feel like educators, administrators, especially in this district, are like sick and tired of punitive punishment. You know, and I think you're all like, yeah, thank you, right? And we see, you know, with restorative practices and bringing kids together, the victim and, you know, whatever the harm is, the two or three kids that are involved in these situations, notifying parents, telling them what, you know, happened, what I've been able to discover and the truths and the lies and, all, you know, whatever the situation is, bringing kids together and saying, hey, you know, your kind of like consequence is having to talk to these kids about the harm you caused and how it made that other kid feel. You need to listen to that. And so there's that piece, right? And then there's the, how do we move on? Like there is, there's something within the, our community that is wrong. You know, you were mean or you, you know, did something that caused a significant pause in education and the learning of you know, your classmates. We need to have a conversation about this. We need to figure out you know, how we can get you back in the class and how the people that are impacted by it feel valued. And they're like, all right, I trust that this probably won't happen again because we've had this open conversation. And it needs to be safe, it needs to be valued, it needs to be authentic. Um, and we've, so we're just, we're just starting that work like authentically, but we've seen, you know, good support from parents, you know, kind of waivers at times, like sometimes parents are weary to say, I don't really want my kid in that meeting to have to face that. You know, they are the ones, the aggressor. And I get that, but it's like, they're the aggressor because they've never had to face like, the true consequence of the victim saying like, hey, this really impacted me. So like, as we kind of break down that traditional consequence barrier, where we hope to see, you know, gains and a reduction uh, in negative behaviors and an increase in, you know, positive intent, positive outcomes. and 
you know, quite honestly, kids being nice to each other. But mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, you know, that simple, really. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we had to put ACE in there because what, <laughs> you know, what restorative practice community and culture slide doesn't have ACE in it. Uh, <laughs> but in all seriousness, um, ACE, you know, and Pete for that matter are pivotal parts of, of this puzzle, right? Um, you know, obviously, on a disciplinary side, we keep Pete out of it, but like to bring the kids back to a level where we are able to communicate and talk effectively, ACE at times, you know, when it's appropriate, you know. Can be brought in and used, and you know, we do see a shift in kids, you know, kind of demeanor, which really is the intent. Um, and then the, the last one, which is different and new, and we presented it, you know, last month on it, but you know, Project Adventure, right? Um, it's just a different way of thinking, it's a different way to get kids, adults, anyone that participates in it involved. Um, and the ropes is just like a tiny piece of it, it it's, it's just like once you've mastered all the stuff that Project Adventure, you know, with social, emotional, and community, and um, you know, collaborative work, the ropes just become part of like, the activity. It's, 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 I'm almost looking at it now, currently, as like a secondary piece to the learning that, you know, what Project Adventure really is behind. And it's teamwork, collaboration, you know, and getting kids involved in a task that gets them out of their chairs. <laughs> So this is um the, our our final slide. Are there questions for Jeff before? I... Yeah, Alex, questions. Oh, Maybe it's just hour. I shouldn't be out there. I remember being in Mali. One of my most vivid and long lasting memories was I think it was like once a month on a Friday at the end of the week we would like knock off like the last hour and there was like a like special elective students like would, would, would submit a, uh, an idea to do a, a special like you know group like a little club yeah. they would all get together i forget what it was called but it was it was like so fun we, we actually skateboarded you can imagine nice. but other other kid you know groups did other things well student choices is really what what you remember is yeah. oh yeah okay i mean yeah i don't know how long that lasts but yeah. is that well i'm just saying student choice you remember it because it's impactful because yeah. you guys had a say in what yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Well, I think we touch on on almost all of these here. So if there's anyone in particular that you want to No, I think that the only one that I really that, that, that doesn't just re, um, recap is probably the um the addition of the SEL tier one instruction. So I talked about that a little bit, but I'll go into a little more detail. So we are planning on having a teacher that comes in in the fall and is part of the specialist cycle that will provide a foundation for all our kids with social emotional skills. So um, and this is the attempt to help provide that foundation that so many of our kids are, are demonstrating lacking skills with. So the person will the first year do the instruction um, for all kids uh, with, with potentially trails. That's what is indicated when they do some other things as well. And then in future years, it will be the sixth grade gets the foundation and then we would function as a tier two intervention as we do with math and literacy for social emotional learning. So there would be a process for identifying students who need an extra scoop of social emotional instruction and they would, just like we talked about with math and literacy, rotate through in a term and get additional instruction, whether it's um, about anxiety or self-regulation or perseverance, whatever is holding them up, this is the plan for that. Um, other things here, I think the rest of it is all things that we've talked about. Oh, um, the reorganization of special ed services are two of our current named programs, Custom House and um, the Student Support Center are going to be revamped into what we're terming uh, partnership services. So there's a little bit of streamlining going on there. There are some things that work in Custom House around students having a small group skill support block around having a social group. Um, so that will be part of the whole program for all the kids, not program, part of the services that all kids are attached to. Um, all of these kids are fully mainstream, so it's a full inclusion program. Um, and then in addition to that, one of the shifts we're making is um, with our adjustment counselors. Um, currently, all three of our, our adjustment counselors work with all three grades. 
So in order to streamline it and make it more effective, each adjustment counselor will be assigned to a grade level. So at each grade level, we will have a guidance counselor and adjustment counselor that works with students in partnership services, but also services other students that might not need some uh, that level of service, and then the assistant principal. And all three of those people will move with the kids. So we'll start with them at sixth, go to seventh, and go to eighth. So they know the kids well. It will help inform the teachers at the next grade level. And then it provides them the opportunity to not be running to student review team meetings at seventh grade, then eighth grade, then sixth grade, there with sixth grade, or there with seventh grade, or there with eighth. So three uh, adjustment uh, yes, the end of those, no, um, no, the three adjustment counselors came in with COVID two years ago. Be the second, oh, second. Yeah, because uh, um, in the first bunch I, I did, we added it. Right. And then, and I, and I the, that one, I it shifted it from a special ed teacher to an adjustment counselor. Anyway, um, no, it was an addition. Yes. We added another before. the year before you were here. Okay. okay. Um, so that, that is new. Having the this be the second year of that. Yeah. Yeah, it appears it's Mark. It's Mark's second year. No. Oh, no he's he's guided. No, that he needs flat. It's not a good addition. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, we're excited about that. Um, I just want to, sorry, you, no, I'm good. I wanted to sort of um, sort of recap and just a couple of takeaways. You can take that slide off. Um, <laughs> How long did you work on that? No, I was I was like no questions. <laughs> so a couple of things. So a couple of, uh, one sort of just addition and then no other recap. So the crucial piece especially for middle school is, is kids are connected, they're belong and you have a, have a say in things, okay? Can I connect any further, okay? And while Ben has been working on that for a long time, we made it really clear in the plan for ongoing improvement by working with the school, and this is priority one, goal, priority one, goal one, and we go mainly in that area about belonging and engagement is about student, you know, students taking ownership, being involved in decision-making, Engagement along, and you just saw really good examples of that. So that's just been connecting the work that they've described and they're doing. It's teachers, assistant principals, principals, Kate, others, guide counselors, the plan for our improvement. Okay, it's really driving that. And I think by shining a light on it, it's really I think I think accelerated the work that folks are actually doing. So that's an important piece because that, that's a foundation, that's foundational, right? The other piece is that the student learning isn't where we want it to be. Okay, I'll be clear about that. I think folks have been clear about that. We want growth to be better. Um, we want you know, depth to be better. We want engagement to be better. Um, and uh, while that concerns me, um, that's one takeaway. The other takeaway is uh, mainly doing the things to shift that. Okay, and that's uh, starting with belonging and student voice and choice and engagement, and then gets into the curriculum work, gets into the data work. Gets into the interventions, gets into uh, interventions are also affecting social education instruction in terms of the uh, academic support classes. You know, so I don't want to, to walk away with this thinking that we think that we've got it wired. Okay? It's not done. Okay. It's the work is accelerating, the right things are, are happening and, and are, are getting into place even more. Um, and we have really dedicated, skilled staff, and that combination of those things is going to lead to deeper learning, deeper engagement, and, and, and uh, better results, but so I think that's the pieces that we are putting the, the teams and the teachers and the, are working together in a really focused way, putting this into place at many levels. And there's way ways to go. So that's a, that's that's my message to all of you. I hope that's what what comes across. Because it's supposed to like that text. So we're, folks are working so hard on it every day. I'm really, and I really believe they're working on the right thing. If some of very small things, which I know you're already aware of, and I know you're already aware of, and I think it's even been mentioned when James has been here, but you know, the eighth grade is you know struggling on a lot of things, and obviously they're about to go through this big transition to ninth grade. So I know already, but I'm just sort of saying it out loud that you guys have a lot of attention on them, particularly in preparing the ninth, you know, the teachers who were going to, you know. The communication between the eighth grade and the ninth grade about how 
you know, because it feels like they they may need extra support. And with some you're already on it. Well, thank you. Sure. Thanks yes, for thank having us. Thank you very much. Stay away. Thanks for being here. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you for the rest of our time. <laughs> 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 Back up. And you should. But thank you for sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Okay. We will move on to action. Can I continue? Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah. First item under action is the revised. Yes, yeah, we got we got no. Just quickly, so we had a snafu in the calendar, which none of us caught, <laughs> uh, which was we had the wrong week for February vacation uh, a year April, April, April vacation April. a year from now. Okay. Um, we had a lot of eyes. Oh, we saw that one too. Oh yeah, <laughs> we did the multiple times, all of us. So it was like the third week. The th it's just the same week, but then we noticed that the well, of course, soon you shared with teachers, someone who looked by us, and anyway. Um, so we just want to that's posted, but just want to make sure we have the formality of approving the, the revised calendar. So what's in your packets is the calendar with the correct April break. Next year. I move that we approve the revised calendar in the packet. Second. The revised calendar for fiscal in year 20. Yes. Yes. What is it, 23, 24? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No discussion, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh -huh. Vote, please. Ms. Wiesen? Yes. Jefferson yes. Lancy? Mr. Melvin? Yes. Mr. Minio? Certainly. Ms. Prince? Yes. And Ms. Watson? Yes. Okay. On, on, sorry. Well, I, I'm the grants. Yeah. I'm going to the grants. Well, I just want to uh, explain. Warren doesn't have an amount. What's that? Warren, Warren doesn't have an amount. The last one's yeah. one. I, I can explain that. Okay. Well, I'm going to try to explain GF1. Uh, I don't have a slide of this, but I'll, I'll do it verbally. The GHS and O'Malley Auditorium Feasibility Study, PDF $20,000. That's $25,000 towards a $75,000 um, study. Um, what we are beginning, um, and I said we because it's us and also GEF is, 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 is uh, really helpful thinking through this. We realized more and more that, as you have heard again and again and, and acknowledged today, tonight, our performing arts programs are, are getting better and better and more and more involvement. Um, and that's, that's from a lot of work from our staff, from the public, from families, students, um, and also GEF has been a huge part of that. And we also, as we go to those our places, the, the two auditoriums, GHS and Mailey, look around and realize that, hmm, maybe these places aren't the sort of quality of the experience that matches the, the performances. And so we're beginning a process on um, learning about how we can um, improve and upgrade them. Uh, anything from sound and lighting, um, sound and lighting to access to um, um, just uh, you know, surfaces, you know, new, seats, that sort of stuff. That takes uh, money in order to just learn what we can do and what it would cost. And so we're going to uh, first do the feasibility study, which will give us a sense of cost and scope, and then um, hopefully work with GF and others, um, as well as the city, of course, and the school and all of you to um, to raise the dollars to get, uh, then, then decide what we want to do, what you know what the, what the scope is, doesn't mean we do everything, we may not be able to. But then decide what the nature of the projects will be, then you know, pursue funding over time to get them. So that's what that kicks off. Um, and we're putting $2,000 um, uh, funding to get that study cost. I, I, I was disappointed to learn how much money you have to spend in order to learn how much project even, even is, but that's you know, checking with others, like Mike Hale, they confirm it's what you need to do. So, so that grant. And so GF has been a GF and also I mean, Kathy has been a big part of it. In terms of just uh, looking at other, um, we mentioned Chelsea High School, look at their auditorium because they've done some re uh, rehab there. Um, so, look closely at what we're doing. And the hope there, similar to, I would think, this, the, the deal of the stadium is that we would get private 
donations. To the yeah, PDF. yeah, yeah. So I think that it'll, 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 uh, the intent here or the desire is to public private partnership. Yeah. Part, you know, yeah, on that. And, and, and OPGA has already been a great partner on it and yeah. thinking, but also just finished funding. Okay. And they will uh, help us with that as well. Can I ask that we refer this to be in a for a discussion, put this on a plan, a capital plan, as opposed to just taking money to something that hasn't been discussed as a group before accept money on it. So this is a so we'll just put it off for two weeks till our next week meeting. Sure, I think so. I mean it's a, it's a study to understand what we might do. It's not to do any work. No, I understand that, okay. but I just want to make sure that it fits in our priorities of what we're doing yeah, capital so, projects. Yeah. That's all. Yeah, so, but I'm not that, saying I'm against it. I just think sure. it yeah. should be more of a conversation before we start accepting money to do something that we haven't discussed as a group. Sure. That so so yeah. So so and we mean it would be enough next week. So if we put it on next week's yeah. agenda, it would fall that we could put this approval on our next school committee. Yeah. So not my decision to do that. So yeah. But I think it's a, yeah. I just yeah. think it's the proper channels and do progress. That's all. Or talk about doing projects and what our priorities are. Okay. No, and I'm no, not no. saying it's not a good, yeah. good project. No, 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 I just I think that that's not my decision. We're to come at a whole committee to accept a grant to do something that we haven't really discussed. Yeah, I yeah. just think it needs a little bit more yeah. vetting. And what I can, what I can, what we can do at that that meeting is bring to you the scope of the feasible feasibility studies, so you see what they're going to actually produce for us. Mm -hmm. Um, and the cost, obviously, the cost, right? Um, yeah, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Right. Um, do you want to talk about the other G, GF grants? Or should I just make a oh. motion? I'll make yeah. a motion so that then we can meet to this. Yeah, I think you're going to talk to the third one. Um, I'll make a motion that we accept that we approve the grants from the Gloucester Education Foundation. Um, one Beeman Theater Program for five hundred dollars, Plum Cove Theater Program for five hundred dollars, Resident Scientists at O'Malley Foundation Middle School for fourteen thousand dollars. And I so move. Second. Okay. I thought you might want to explain the Resident Scientists at O'Malley. Mm -hmm. So we've had that we've in the past. We had, not we don't currently have it, but it, that Resident Scientist will work in the um, science. Lab that it'll mainly and help with experiments or whatever. It's a donor, um, a private donor that comes through GEF um, specifically to help with curriculum and, and um, further the wonderful work they're doing in the science lab. Okay. Any discussion? Okay, roll call vote, please. Ms. Reeson. Yes. Chairperson Clancy. Yes. Mr. Melvin. Yes. Mr. Minion. Yes. Ms. Prince. Yes. And Ms. Watson. Yes. Um, the next uh, item is uh, Department of Education, um, Elementary and Secondary Education Grants. I believe that we have approved um, fiscal year 23 FC 185 high quality instructional materials implementation grant in the amount of $90,000 and fiscal year 23 21st Century Community Learning Centers Grant FC 644 Internship Enhancement Grant in the amount of $44,640. And I sub so Second. Yeah, here, right? All right, the first one, um, 185 High Quality Instructional Materials Implementation Grant. That's a grant, obviously, from DESE to implant, uh, not implant, <laughs> implement, it's getting late, implement um, a curriculum that we had already selected at the time that we applied. So um, it, it cannot go towards only, but it could, it was written to go towards the wit and wisdom um, implementation. Um, so what it's paying for is a lot of stipends as far as literacy leaders and um, some summer work and those kind of trainings that we have to have, and also for the um, outside consultants to have wit and wisdom trainers come here and work with our teachers. So um, it is a grant that needs to be spent by the end of spent by the end of the summer, so that we have lots of training and literacy leaders and meetings that have been going on. But this is how we're going to be able to. Fund them as, as well. Um, that um, that's the first one, and the second one is twenty uh, first century. It is um, going to go along with O'Malley Academy, and it's going to allow us to have interns from the high school come down and work with our um, middle school students to help in within the, the academy after schools. Sure. Thank you. 
you have your hand up? No. Okay. Quick question. Um, the first one. When we do that work over the summer, is there going to be any training the trainer involved in that professional development yes. so that we can carry on? Yes, um, we're and also yeah, explain that. Yes, yes. Information. so absolutely there is. Um, we're also making sure our coaches who are outstanding um, have that extra level of okay. training um, because um, they we rely on them to do training all the time, but they don't necessarily always get their own training. So we want them, they already are the experts, but we really want to solidify that in this new curriculum. Um, so they also will get some additional training. Um, so absolutely. Okay. Three of our photo, please. There wasn't a motion yet. Oh, 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 oh there was. Yes, sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Ms. Reeson. Yes. Chairperson Clancy. Yes. Mr. Melvin. Yes. Mr. Minio. Yes. Ms. Prince. Yes. Ms. Watson. Yes. Okay. You want to explain? Want to explain that, everyone? So this is um, it's a cyber security awareness program. There's not an amount because we got the grant is we are accepted into this program. And from that, we have we have access to certain cyber um, security training that uh, most of leadership and a few others will take. And once we have um, completed, you know, <laughs> once they have completed the cyber, once we've had everyone complete the cyber security training, what it allows us is to have an insurance to help protect our network if, if something were to happen. So there's not really a monetary amount. What it does is, to receive the insurance, it's contingent on us completing the cybersecurity. So being brought into that program is giving it, allowing us the insurance for our card. This is about us not going for you know, phishing or ransomware or worrying phishing, mm -hmm. phishing and ransomware is scams, not falling, not falling for that. The focus of the program. So I just had this training on the state side. And now they send us emails at work during the day to test us whether we yeah, open things or not. Yeah. Now I don't open anything from the job board yeah. because I'm afraid it's a test. So it's probably the same grant. Yeah. Yeah. One very, very similar. It's good training. That's great. Yeah, we, we get, we get, um, we we get the city, the city IT and, 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 and floor IT. But now it makes me you know, know, the new, uh, new uh, new 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 We actually, it yeah. was an email from an outside provider, their personal. You know, got hacked something, something came through, and the principal said, I'm not opening it. I know who it's yeah. from, but it, it doesn't pass. It doesn't pass based yeah. on this kind of training. So it's a good thing. Okay. Unless you're really sending out an email, you want them to read it, and they say, No, I'm not going to trust it. Yeah. Because you spelled something wrong, because yeah. that's one of the things. <laughs> that's where I'm at. Okay. I move that we approve the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Executive Office of Technology and Services and Security Grant. Um, municipal cybersecurity awareness program. Discussion? Roll call vote, please. Ms. Gleason? Yes. Yeah. Jefferson Clancy? Yes. Mr. Melvin? Yes. Ms. Prince? Yes. Okay. Uh, that concludes the action. Um, is there anything else to add regarding these veterans' elementary school? Uh, just quickly, I um, had a billing committee meeting last week. Uh, things, as I said, on time, on schedule, on budget. Um, so much so they've been able to uh, bring back some of the uh, elements that were valuing a year out, like benches outside. Um, is one of them or like normal ones, um, and then craft receptacles, things like that. Uh, different border or a border around the playground, and, and uh, really now. We're reminded to fill in the project team that we don't have to come in at budget, we can come at under budget. So I want to make sure that they can make decisions around you know between that as a goal now at budget. It's pretty remarkable that project of this size at this time is now working towards coming under budget. So and they have been working on Saturdays for at least the last and the other thing is, um, I have suggested that they schedule another tour for us since okay. it's starting to look more, okay. you know, in other days that it would be kind of fun and exciting to see it at this point. There is a on March 27th uh, city council. That's an advisory tour. So 
we can go we can go then or we no, have can, yeah, yeah. 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 that's on the note <laughs> <laughs> might be a violation of executive session we'll find a date absolutely um okay that concludes the business oh bill did you have something you wanted to Oh, uh, just uh, request a, a review of the student cell phone policy uh, by the to be carried out by the I think the personnel subcommittee. Pro program. program. Programs, yeah. So, um, and uh, that they come forth with any recommendations to the full council. Without objection. Right. <laughs> Is there an IT policy that should go with that too? If they can. Um, that. Is it social media? Social media, something. There might be a couple calls. Social media, something. Both. There'll be both, I guess. Social media. I guess we could do both. Well, Melissa had already referred um, filming. Pause, yeah, filming. Oh, I didn't know. Well, I didn't. I sent a suggestion in an email. I think Bill's officially doing it. Is... No, there was referral Did months I? ago. Was it? Yeah. That's good. Uh, well, now there's another reason. So okay. I would double up on both that, the social media yeah, no, and the. Uh, yeah, cell phone. What was the third one? Something about filming. I thought there was a night. I thought there was a night. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 There was an IT policy. Okay. Just Yeah. There was an IT policy. There's a general policy that covers the county. You typically don't know who knows. Acceptable use. Except that's 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 the one I'm thinking of. Acceptable use policy. Acceptable use for anything. Acceptable use policy. Yeah. And I don't know. Just that one? No. All three. All three. All three. All three. Filming, social media, and cell phone. Well, I think the filming falls under the cell phone policy. And then the acceptable use goes with the cell phone policy. And then was what was the third? Social media. Social media, social media. yeah. Exactly. The whole level, policy. I guess, assume the whole policy. The whole policy. The whole level. All right. Social media, cell phones, and notes. Okay. Anybody want to make a note? Second. Okay. Great. Brian? Yes. Yes. It was glancing. Yes. Mr. Melvin. Yes. Mr. Minio. Yes. Mr. Prince. No. Kidding. Yes, absolutely. 